Okay, good evening. Welcome to this public meeting regarding Fort Calhoun Station. My name is Linnea Wilkins. I'm one of the licensing project managers out of the headquarters office located in Washington, D.C. And I will be the coordinator for tonight's meeting. As always, we appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules to come see what Nuclear Regulatory Commission and OPPD have to say. This meeting is being recorded and will be available on the Fort Calhoun Special Oversight page on the NRC website. The focus of tonight's meeting is the safety of Fort Calhoun Station. We are not going to discuss any OPPD financial matters or fiscal business. We are going to focus on the safety of Fort Calhoun Station. As a reminder, we at the NRC place high priority in being open to the public and informing the public of what we do and what's going on. As you came in outside, there's a table full of information. First, there's the public feedback form. Using this form, you can let us, the NRC, know how we're doing. If you have any suggestions or any comments on how these meetings are run, you can write, write down any of your comments on the public feedback form, and we take to heart everything that you say. They are postage paid and self-addressed. Please fill it out and drop it in a mailbox at your convenience. Also on the table are note cards like so. We will have a question and answer portion following the presentations. If you do not wish to come up and state your question or ask your, uh, excuse me, state your comment or ask your question, you can write it down on a note card. Either I or one of my colleagues will collect it and we will read it on your behalf. Other information on the table are the recently updated restart checklist and basis document as well as the meeting slides. These materials will be referred to during the presentations and are available for you to follow along with. I'd also like to note that the latest inspection report dated September 23rd, we just released it yesterday, is available on the Fort Calhoun Special Oversight webpage as well as in Adams. This meeting is between the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and Omaha Public Power District regarding the safety of Fort Calhoun Station. This is the latest in a series of public meetings. Previous meetings have been held here in Omaha, as well as in Blair, Nebraska, and the headquarters office in Washington, D.C. The meeting summaries and videos are also available on the Fort Calhoun Special Oversight webpage. I'd like to now welcome staffers from your elected officials. We have representatives from Senator Johan's office, Representative Fortenberry's office, as well as Representative Terry's office here tonight. We appreciate their continued interest in the safe operation of Fort Calhoun. Again, the purpose of tonight's meeting is the safety and safe operation of Fort Calhoun Station. At this time, I would like to let these two groups introduce themselves, starting with the NRC. I'm Tony Bagel. I'm the Manning Chapter of the 50 Chairman. I'm Louise Lund, and I am the uh, Manning 350 um, Panel Vice Chairman. My name is Mike Hay. I'm a branch chief in Region 4 office in Texas, and I'm responsible for inspection activities and oversight of Fort Collins Station. I'm Mike Markley. I'm in the NRC headquarters office. I'm the chief of licensing for Region 4 reactors, including Fort Collins Station. And I'm John Kirkland. I'm the senior resident inspector of Fort Collins. Thank you. Now for the Fort Collins management to introduce themselves. Yeah, good evening. I'm Luke Portaposi. I'm the site vice president, chief nuclear officer. Mike Prosper, I'm the plant manager. Scott Swanson, the site operations director. I'm Ron Short, I'm the assistant engineering director at Fort Calhoun. I'm Bruce Rash, I'm the senior recovery manager for Fort Calhoun. I'm Kerry Eating, I'm the nuclear oversight manager at OPC. Thank you. Just to give you a high level look at tonight's agenda, the NRC will discuss the current status of assessment activities associated with the confirmatory action letter, restart checklist including current and upcoming inspections. The Fort Calhoun management will then discuss recovery status. Following the presentations, we will have a short break and then proceed to the public question and answer session where you will have an opportunity to ask your questions or to make any comments. Again, there are no cards to fill out on the table. One of us will collect your card and I will read your question or comment on your behalf. We will go until about 9 o'clock or until the question and answers are done, whichever comes first. If we do run out of time and there are remaining questions, 
The NRC will be available immediately following the meeting to answer any of your questions. Again, this meeting is being recorded and will be available on the Fort Calhoun Special Oversight webpage. With that said, I'll now turn it over to Tony Bagel, the chair of the 0350 panel, to start the meeting. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, first thing I want to do is say thank you very much uh, for attending this meeting. Uh, nice to look out there and see the familiar faces. I really appreciate your involvement and, and your insights on the uh, Fort Calhoun safety. Today's meeting is really a continuation of the public dialogue that we've had with Fort Calhoun regarding Fort Calhoun safety. We've had meetings in July, in July 24th, and then we had another meeting in uh, late August in the Arlington office in Texas. We plan to have another meeting here in, in October time, right? hopefully in Blair, Nebraska, to continue this open dialogue of our evaluation of Fort Calhoun performance, as well as give Fort Calhoun an opportunity to discuss their progress in addressing their concerns. So for today's meeting, what is what has changed since the last public meeting? Well, we have we've continued to do our inspections of the important Mm -hmm. items that need to be addressed at Fort Calhoun Station. And based on our inspection, we have seen some progress. We've identified 18 specific items that are in confirmatory action letters that felt that they need to be addressed prior to Fort Calhoun being able to restart. And last time we were here, we talked about three items that have been addressed. Now the list is up to five. I don't think we that Fort Calhoun took action to address the issue, and then we have independently reviewed that their actions are thorough, that they really address the issue. So progress being made, and as we'll, Mike Hay will present later, there's a multiple other areas that we're getting close to completion of, uh, and that we, the Fort Calhoun completed their action. And we have completed our inspections and we're in the final throes of evaluation of those issues. So some progress is, is being made. But going forward, we will continue to do any inspections and be here practically every day uh, making sure that the issues are being addressed. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Louise for, for some of her perspective. Yeah, good evening. Um, you know, I just want to take a minute to um, mention the fact that, you know, you see us here at the table representing the review. There is, you know, Tony, myself, and Mike, and Mike, and John here. But in actuality, you know, even though we're here representing the review, there are teams of teams and teams of inspectors that go out and do these reviews. And in addition to that, back at headquarters um, for the technical review staff, there's a number of technical review staff in all kinds of disciplines that have been involved in this review as well. So really what you see here are, you know, is really sort of the tip of the iceberg as far as um, the amount of people and the attention that's been paid to um, ensuring the safety you know, of um, the Fort Falcon Station and making sure that the, step, that the review is a comprehensive and a rigorous one. So um, that sort of lead into what Mike's going to discuss um, with you tonight about um, what progress has been made with the reviews. Thanks, Elise. I'm going to move your mic over. Yeah, the, the microphones are going in and out yeah. and it's flipping back and forth and I it's echoey and weird. There's a guy over in the corner doing something. And so <laughs> we'll get it figured out. And, and I've sent Lene out to try and get somebody to work through this issue for okay. us. So see, see if Mike's I just want to, I just wanted to say something. Okay. <laughs> no, I could tell right behind you. So thank you. All right, we'll we'll go ahead and stop if if it keeps acting up and try to get it figured out. Uh, good evening, and and again, we we thank you all for coming out here tonight. Last week we issued a updated restart checklist and basis document. And I wanted just to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about what those documents, uh, what they represent, because I know everyone hasn't been here for all the meetings. The restart checklist is a, a list of specific items 
as Tony mentioned, that entail the items that the licensee uh, needs to evaluate and take actions on uh, in response to the decline in station performance. And as Tony mentioned, there were 18 specific items in which the licensee was responsible for, for taking action. In addition to the restart checklist, we issued what's called a restart checklist basis document. And that basis document <coughs> consists of approximately 450 specific items that basically describe the, the specific inspections that the NRC performs so that we ensure that we adequately review each of the items that are in the restart checklist. And as I said, we recently issued an update to that last week, which basically uh, identifies which areas have been completed, which areas are currently in progress, and, and which areas are scheduled for future inspection activities. Now I know we, we brought copies of that here tonight and hopefully everybody that's interested has a copy. Uh, if anyone doesn't have a copy and wants one, please raise your hand and we'll, we'll bring one to you. Seeing none, I assume everyone's got one. Uh, you know, based, based on the inspection results, the NRC is closing one of the restart checklist items and that's, that's in addition to the four that have been previously closed. And this one dealt with the, the yellow flooding finding that involved inadequate flood mitigation strategy. Okay, can you all hear me now? Do I have to start back from the beginning or are we okay? And I'll, I'll talk more about the closure of this yellow finding in a, in a future slide, but I just wanted you to know that that, that that item has been closed. Currently there are over 300 items that have been inspected and have been deemed adequate for closure, and that represents approximately 70% of the 450 items that are in the basis document. 25% of the items are under review, and many of those are currently near completion. And the remaining 5% are items that have not yet been inspected, but are scheduled to be inspected in the near future. So the, the, the big picture is of the 18 items that are in the restart checklist, five items are closed, six are very near completion, and seven are in progress. Uh, next slide, please. So I, I mentioned that, that we recently closed the yellow finding. And I wanted, I wanted to describe the, the process by which we've been going through to close these, these important areas. You know, if, if you take a look at the restart checklist, there's one item, and it basically says, yellow flooding issue. And then if you look at the restart checklist basis document, you'll see that there's 18 specific inspection items that we looked at to verify that the licensee had adequately addressed that particular issue. The inspections that we did have lasted over a year in this area. We've had multiple inspectors look at different items related to flooding. We ensured that the licensee adequately addressed the root causes and, and uh, contributing causes for the problem. In addition, we ensured that the licensee is adequately addressing the full extent of the condition. And what I mean by that is flooding is just one natural event. There are other natural events that the station has to be able to provide protection for it. So we also took a look at events such as tornadoes, low river level, and cold, and cold weather conditions. 
based on all of our inspections, uh, we determined that the licensee has adequately addressed those issues. And they also have future plans to even take a look in more depth at different areas related to natural events. So all of these inspections, like I said, took place over approximately a year. And recently they were completed. And so what happens from that, from that point is we have what's called a, a panel. And since the licensee is in the manual chapter 0350 process, uh, we call it the manual chapter 0350 panel. So we had the inspectors who were involved in reviewing that area describe to the panel what they had inspected, the results of those inspections, uh, anything that they felt wasn't necessarily a restart issue, but was a issue important enough for the licensee to have to address at a future point. And, and based on all of those discussions and us having a good understanding that not only are the immediate issues resolved, but the longer term actions are understood by the licensee, the panel then took a vote as to whether or not we agreed that we should close the area or keep it open based on any particular concerns. And just the other week, we, uh, we briefed this with the panel and a decision was made to close this, this area. So this is the process that we go through for all of the restart checklist areas. I just wanted you to understand the process for this one particular one. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> There's a number of inspections that are currently in progress, and like I said, there are a few inspections that are scheduled in the near future. I wanted to just spend a little bit of time tonight talking about some of the more uh, complex inspections that we're doing that have involved uh, multiple people, multiple specialties, and uh, you know, it's 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 really been a uh, uh, tremendous effort on the NRC's part to, to inspect these, these areas. The first one deals with the containment internal structure. Uh, for those that, that have been following, you know, the, the licensee identified well over a year ago that the containment internal structure had some nonconformances where the, the actual as-built uh, structure didn't conform to the uh, licensing basis conditions. The licensee's done a, a, a number of, of uh, analysis to support the operability of the structure. Uh, what that means is they've done analysis that demonstrates that the structure is, is operable and capable of meeting its design functions, even though it doesn't conform to the uh, licensing conditions. Uh, what what that means is that, you know, if the NRC agrees with that evaluation, then they would be safe to restart, that adequate safety margins do exist, but with an understanding that the licensee needs to take corrective actions in the near future uh, in order to restore the plant to how it was licensed. And typically these corrective actions are considered timely, uh, you know, based on the complexity of the problem and based on you know, the, the uh, uh, time frame by which they complete the, the actions. And as, as most of you can probably, you know, understand, can, uh, fixing the containment internal structure is a large endeavor. And, and so, the, you know, just the analysis alone for operability took approximately a year. So it'll take, it'll take quite a bit of time to figure out the, the appropriate uh, corrective actions and work. We're expecting to have more discussions on, you know, next outage, what, what plans to be done to address these, these issues. I, I will tell you though, you know, this, this particular issue has involved regional experts, experts from another region uh, in, the, uh, in the Region 3 office, and folks from headquarters. And like I said, they've been reviewing this information for approximately a year. Uh, 
they are down to the very end of their reviews and for the most part there's really only one uh, particular area that we're focusing on now but, but it, it, it appears currently that there is adequate safety margin and that you know as of at least today although we haven't concluded our inspections it looks like the containment internal structure uh, will be adequate to support the plant restart. With respect to the geotechnical area, and just to describe what that means, you know, when they had the flood of 2011, most of you have seen pictures where most of the site was, was basically, you know, surrounded by part of the Missouri River. And so after the river subsided, uh, the concern was what impact would there be to to the uh, you know subsoil and and the structures that were sitting on on the uh, ground level and again sort of like the containment internal structure issue we've had a number of inspectors and specialists from both the regions and headquarters looking at this issue uh, we've been looking at this for well over a year now and Again, we're in the final stages of, of just a couple remaining items to be looked at uh, before we make our final conclusion. But as of today, uh, the specialists have not identified any adverse impact uh, to the subsoil or to any of the structures that, that would uh, uh, give us pause for restarting the facility. With respect to tornado missile protection, this was an area back in April when we had our first major O350 team inspection. And again, there was approximately 15 people involved in that inspection. And during this inspection, uh, we identified that the licensee knew they had uh, inadequate tornado missile protection for a couple of areas uh, and they had evaluated that as as being acceptable uh, based on various reasons and through our inspection efforts we we identified that that they hadn't adequately evaluated that problem and and therefore actions were needed to protect those areas uh, to the licensee's credit you know, back in April, there were approximately three areas that we thought weren't adequately protected. But the licensee did a, a thorough review of the whole site, and, and they identified uh, approximately 20 areas that needed to be addressed. And currently, they are implementing modifications to protect all of those areas. Some of you might be aware that the last time we had a public meeting here, there was discussions that pertain to a, a uh, exigent licensing amendment that was in, in progress during that meeting. And that, that particular amendment was, uh, was uh, uh, <coughs> processed basically to support the way in which the licensee was, was modifying the plan for tornado missile protection. And Again, uh, it was NRC involvement that, that led to that process being implemented. And I think for those of you that are interested in the fine details, we are getting close to issuing an inspection report just pertaining to the tornado missile issue probably within the next week or two. With respect to the high pressure safety injection system, uh, this was a, an issue that pertained to the licensee identifying that during certain accident conditions, the high pressure safety injection pumps could possibly be operating in what's called a runout condition. And what that means is that a, a pump is, is basically designed to operate under certain parameters, certain flows, net positive suction head, 
Uh, and and what, what they found was that under certain accident scenarios, the pumps would basically be pumping too much water, which would take them outside of their normal operating uh, uh, conditions, and eventually would result in uh, potential failure of these pumps. The licensee has modified the plant. <clears throat> They've installed what are called or, uh, flow orifices in the piping, and that basically uh, reduces the flow that the pumps uh, put out so that they operate where they should operate and they don't overheat and they don't fail. Uh, the NRC is currently in the process. Uh, we've got reviewers from the region and headquarters uh, looking not only at the modifications that are being made to the plant, but also since now the, the pumps will operate differently during accident conditions, the analysis that basically is done to ensure that under loss of coolant accidents that the emergency core cooling system cools the core, uh, that analysis has changed. And the licensee recently submitted to the NRC for review the results of that analysis. So that, that is currently uh, under review by our experts at headquarters. Not on this list, but I wanted to mention it. Uh, we, we do have a, a team of inspectors on site looking at what's called uh, high energy line break and environmental qualifications. Um, nuclear plants are designed to have to postulate that high energy piping systems could potentially crack and break and therefore those rooms would become harsh environments, meaning there's high temperatures, there's humid environments. And so the requirements are that if you postulate a break, the plants have to be able to demonstrate that they can safely shut down. And in order to do that, some of the equipment that would be exposed to that harsh environment have to be qualified for the environment that they would be in. Uh, a couple years back, the licensee identified that there were some issues uh, with their high energy line break analysis. They've been involved in the past couple of months in modifying the plant to alleviate those concerns. Uh, there is a, a potential licensing action that will uh, take place to, to deal with the high energy line break issue. And like I said, uh, this is one of the inspections that is currently in progress. It's been receiving a lot of attention uh, by the NRC currently there's four inspectors on site uh, this week, and there was three on site last week, and there was three on site a couple of months ago uh, for a couple of weeks. So uh, I just wanted you all to know that that you know this is another area that's receiving a lot of attention. And now I'd I'd like to you know talk about the flood recovery activities. You know this is an area that is in the restart checklist. It basically involves the review of, of systems, structures, and components to make sure that, that the flood of 2011 did not adversely impact the uh, ability of those uh, uh, system structures and components to perform their, their function and, and therefore assure us that the plant is ready for restart. Uh, John, the uh, senior resident at the site, has, has really uh, uh, spearheaded this effort and, and I'd like John to, to walk us through you know basically what what this area is all about and, and where where we're at so John as Mike mentioned um, the, the flood uh, of 2011 potentially impacted uh, really three different areas one would be uh, the soil one would be the structures uh, and Mike already discussed that uh, in the geotechnical area. Uh, and then the other potential impact of the flood would be the equipment uh, that is either uh, in, in the structures or underground. And that's where the focus of uh, Section 2A of the Restart Checklist uh, focused on these items. Uh, as, as far as the identification of what needed to be done, this, uh, these issues, uh, even before 
uh, Fort Calhoun went into manual chapter uh, 0350 oversight. Uh, there was a confirmatory action letter uh, issued that just had to do with flood recovery actions uh, where the NRC uh, identified the items that needed to be uh, evaluated and corrected if necessary uh, prior to restart at that time. And then that confirmatory action letter got rolled into the restart checklist. So what, what my staff, uh, Jacob and I, did uh, in this area is actually kind of twofold. Uh, the licensee would evaluate an area, for example, um, evaluate the uh, circulating water pump and its adequacy uh, to be able to perform post flood. So the licensee performed their tests, performed their analyses while Jacob and I uh, did some verification of that. And then we would independently look at uh, test results and come to our conclusions on whether what they did was adequate. They in turn provide us a package of material which we call a closure package of everything they did and we make sure we have all the information that we need uh, prior to us accepting that item as closed. Uh, in, in Section 2A of the Research Checklist Basis document, uh, there were 82 items uh, that were uh, called out in that. Uh, currently, I'm sorry, 81 items. Uh, currently, five of those remain open. Uh, a couple of those I'm still waiting on uh, closure packages from the licensee. A couple of them I'm substantially done with my review that would uh, have them documented in my next inspection report. Uh, and then one that I'm still kind of looking in that, looking at in that area. Part of those 81 items there were <coughs> To, to make sure everything was covered, you look at a system as a whole uh, to ensure that you didn't miss anything when you uh, made up the restart checklist or the uh, confirmatory action letter. So if you look at the bottom part of Section 2A, it evaluates a uh, system uh, effects for flooding which we did and we looked at those systems uh, specifically only for flooding. Now subsequent to that uh, in section 2B of the restart checklist are looking at systems and their readiness to restart. So now we're looking at everything not just the effects of the systems on the, uh, because of the flood. So we are currently evaluating uh, those systems we've looked at roughly Half of those to date, uh, were, we look at those every day, and our approach on those are to make sure that everything that needs to be done prior to restart, because they are still doing work, are captured and tracked, and all of that work uh, is completed uh, prior to uh, any restart activities which may happen. So as I mentioned, that's roughly 50 percent uh, in that area. So uh, those two areas together uh, in conjunction with uh, geotechnical which looked at the soil and the structures uh, would at, as a whole look at uh, the effects of the flood on the facility. And with that Mike. Okay, thanks John. Uh, next slide please. So What's left? You know, we, we've talked about what's in progress, and uh, I'd like now to talk about what are some of the things that are, that are left to be inspected. Uh, the plant in the near future will be looking at heating up. Uh, that's, that's not starting up, but it's heating up. And, and basically what that means is, you know, the reactor coolant system now is, is all put back together. Uh, they've got uh, the vessel head on, and so the, the system is intact. Can you hear me now? <clears throat> and so what, what the licensee will be doing is running reactor coolant pumps and using what are called pressurizer heaters, and that allows the plant to, to get up to normal operating pressure and temperature 
uh, but it won't be critical. It won't be making power, uh, which is you know something that obviously will happen later after the inspection activities are completed and and the O350 panel has recommended a plant restart uh, or or not. So. What's going to be happening in the near future is they are looking at heating up the plant. And the purpose of that is basically to ensure that when you're up to normal operating pressure and temperature, that you don't have any unexpected, unexpected leaks or any unexpected problems so that you can address that stuff while you're at that plant condition uh, rather than waiting until you try to start the plant up. And then, you know, you don't want to have to shut the plant back down to fix those problems. So, so this is actually a, a step. Uh, you know, the plant's been shut down for a, a good couple of years now, and it's a good opportunity to, to get the plant up and to understand uh, how it's going to operate before it's actually running, uh, you know, as a critical reactor. During this heat up activity, uh, we will have a, another team of inspectors, and this, this team is going to have the, uh, the focus on, they're going to be operations types and type inspectors. Uh, matter of fact, the majority of our inspectors are going to be ex-senior reactor operators, meaning they're ex-licensed operators. And uh, we've, we've even got ex-licensed operators who are qualified on the same plant as Fort Calhoun. So, so this will be a, a good uh, insight for the NRC to understand how well the operators have maintained their skills, uh, even though they've been shut down for a for a good period of time. Also, during during this inspection activity, you know, we we've talked on multiple occasions about the licensee taking actions to protect to what we've described as beyond design basis flood requirements, and the licensee has actually developed a, a strategy in which they would cope with a beyond design basis flood. And during heat up, we're gonna have inspections where we'll you know, walk around with the operators and look at the equipment and understand how they'll use that equipment to uh, basically cope with a beyond design basis flood. So those are, those are two uh, inspection activities that are uh, gonna happen when the plant is, is ready to heat up. Uh, that's all I've got from a, from a presentation perspective. I, I would like just to make one more comment, uh, just to give people a perspective on the, on the level of effort that the NRC has, has uh, applied at Fort Calhoun as compared to a, a typical plant. Uh, a couple of months ago, I, you know, we have processes that show us how many hours the NRC uh, basically, you know, says they've worked on different sites. And uh, a couple months ago, the NRC has utilized approximately 20,000 hours of, of inspection and review time on Fort Calhoun Station. And when I compare that to a normal plant that's like, let's say, column one plant that isn't in increased oversight, they're somewhere between five and 6,000 hours. So, you can see the NRC has, has devoted a lot of resources uh, to ensuring that, that this plant is safe to operate. And, and like I said, you know, a lot of activities have been done and are complete. There's quite a few that are remaining, uh, but the licensee has made good progress, uh, you know, to date. And, uh, you know, there are some more challenges ahead, but, but you know, there has been substantial progress made. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Bagel. <coughs> just like to summarize and provide uh, some insights on the next steps. The next step, the first thing we have to do is to finish our inspection. And not just the inspection, but also the evaluation of the technical issues <coughs> with uh, the technical expert the help from uh, the headquarters office. And we'll going to continue to do is to methodically review each and every one of the issues. And, and I do expect, as we go through our review, that new issues will arise, either from our inspections or evaluations, because we're uh, 
independent. But two, I expect that new issues will arise that, the, that Fort Calhoun themselves will identify as their corrective issues and both extended conditions. So new issues will, will probably come up, and in each case, we'll evaluate each issue to address the, the, the impact on the operational readiness of Fort Calhoun. Once the inspections are completed, then we'll go through a process of determining, okay, have they addressed all the confirmatory actions by the item? And the first step will be a, a management review, and then the O350 panel, which includes folks from the regional office as well as from headquarters, to, to say the issues, have the issues been adequately addressed? And if not, if they haven't been addressed, what more needs to be done to communicate that uh, back to Fort Calhoun Station? Once it gets through, through that stage, then there will be another stage of senior management review at headquarters to, to get concurrence that yes, the issues have been all addressed, or new questions might come from, from that process as well, and then one additional independent check before the NRC will determine that yes, the people, the processes, and the plant or the equipment are ready to support operation of Fort Calhoun. So in summary, progress has been made in Fort Calhoun to address their issues. The NRC has done independent evaluations. Our standards are high, and you see that they've addressed some of these issues, five of 18. Are, are complete. And also at the plant itself, see the physical changes at the plant that have made it more safe. There's still items remaining that we're waiting for Fort Calhoun to provide some additional information. Those, those the number of items get fewer and fewer as the time goes on. And like I talked about, new issues could arise and will require some, some further follow-up. Bottom line for the NRC is that as we've talked about this and I think this is I believe my sixth public meeting here, is that we will be independent and thorough in our, independent, in our verification of plant safety. That, that is our focus. It has been and it will continue to be. So with that, I'm going to turn it over the meeting over to Mr. Kurapati and the Fort Calhoun management to tell us that they're from. Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Bagel. All right, again, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Lou Cordoposti. I'm the Fort Calhoun Station Site Vice President and the Chief Nuclear Officer for OPPD. And we, too, want to thank you for this opportunity tonight. In particular, it, it's important for my team to be able to de demonstrate where we are with respects to our performance, very similar to the comment that Ms. Lund made with respects to the support of the NRC inspectors. It's really our opportunity to represent the significant amount of work that's been done by the men and women, not only at the station, but in many cases off-site support that we've received. So help facilitate our discussion tonight. Our specific topics will include the significant improvements in plant design and reliability in Mike Prospero. Our plant manager will lead us through that discussion. The preparations we've made for the plant, the people and the processes for heat up. And Scott Swanson, our operations director, will lead us through that discussion. The importance of engineering performance of both Ron Short, our assistant engineering director, and Bruce Rash, our, secu our, excuse me, our senior recovery manager, will lead us through that discussion. I'll take care of the update on our plan for sustained improvement, which we developed and docketed and is our road our roadmap post-restart. That also includes the transition to the Exelon nuclear management model and integration of the Exelon fleets. Like previous meetings, we'll also have an opportunity to hear from our independent assessor, our nuclear oversight manager, Mr. Kerry Enan, who will provide his independent perspective on the progress that we made, and I'll have some brief closing remarks. And again, all of these are linked to the renewed vision, mission, and values that we've instilled at the station. So with that, I will turn the presentation over to Mike Prospero, our plant manager. Okay, uh, slide three, please. Thank you, Lou. Good evening. I am Mike Prospero, the plant manager at Fort Calhoun Station. <laughs> We have accomplished an impressive amount of equipment and system upgrades at the station during this two-year outage. A mountain of work has been completed, 
ranging from physical work in the plant to paperwork in the offices, resulting in a plant that is safer and is more reliable today. First, I would like to describe changes we have made in our high energy, line break, and electrical equipment qualification programs. During certain conditions involving a pipe rupture, releasing high pressure and high temperature fluids, electrical equipment can be challenged during uh, these environmental conditions. This involves unique and complex engineering work to predict and evaluate those conditions and ensure our equipment will be reliable and fulfill its safe requirements under all expected conditions. We installed over 30 modifications, including rewinding the auxiliary building exhaust fan motors, replacing multiple motor-operated valves, and replacing many limit and pressure switches. We have also replaced over 100 wiring terminal blocks and upgraded the control logic on several important valves. We have also restored and enhanced the equipment affected by the 2011 flood and strengthened our protection against potential flooding conditions required by our basis on Florida license. In addition, we developed a new flooding mitigation system to mitigate the effects of a flood that are much more severe than our license requirement. The equipment of this flooding mitigation system shown in these pictures is staged inside the turbine building and includes portable pumps, generators to power those pumps, and the necessary hoses and valve manifolds to provide cooling to the reactor during potential ex extraordinary flood conditions. Station procedures and guidelines are in place, and the plant staff has been trained to install and operate the portable systems that flood levels are projected to achieve to approach these extreme conditions. Slide four, please. <clears throat> Teamwork by our engineers, work planners, and maintenance staff is producing results in the tornado missile protection work. <clears throat> we are completing the installation work for multiple barriers that will prevent potential tornado debris from affecting safety equipment at the plant. We have approximately 100 skilled craft workers who have already successfully completed installation of of over 100 tons of steel, steel barriers. Some of this work to protect the plant equipment is shown in these pictures. Slide five, please. The containment penetration, the containment structure includes electrical penetrations, assemblies that allow electrical signals and power to enter the containment building while maintaining the integrity of the containment to prevent the release of radioactive materials in the event of an accident. One electrical penetration assembly is pictured here on the right. We identified certain electrical penetrations lacked redundancy in their sealing function because they contained Teflon based seals or wiring insulation. That Teflon material used in the original construction on the interior side of the containment did not hold up to long term high radiation levels that may exist at Fort Calhoun were to have a major event. We replace hundreds of containment penetration assemblies that now provide redundant barriers to the release of radioactive materials in the event of an accident. We also removed and capped more than 100 spare penetration assemblies. Replacement of the penetration assemblies required reconnection and testing of approximately 11,000 wires. We also replaced segments of the chemical and volume control system charging and letdown piping. Originally, that piping contained socket welds that are difficult to examine throughout the life of the plant. The new piping contains butt welds that can be effectively inspected to detect and correct degradation before it becomes more a more significant concern. In preparation for the future, power upright at Fort Kelvin Station. We installed a new isophase bus duct cooling system pictured here on the left. Slide six, please. We upgraded our turbine control system with a state-of-the-art digital system. This digital system takes advantage of the increased reliability and 
functionality of the modern processes of control equipment. The turbine startup process uses, using the old system was not automated and bringing the turbine to full speed required significant operator action. The new system is more automated, simplifying the operator actions necessary for turbine operation and, and control, reducing the likelihood of plant transients. The old system also required unique spare parts and specialized staff for maintenance. Also, as part of the future Fort Kellen station power operate, we installed nuclear detector well coolers, we upgraded supports for several plant systems, and we replaced the existing heater drain tank, which is located in the basement of our turbine building, with a larger tank having more than a thousand gallons of increased capacity new piping and isolation valves for increased reliability and easier maintenance. Slides up. Yes, I, I just have a couple questions. Uh, specifically on the plant improvement. Did you involve the operators in identifying the improvements made to the plant? Yes, the digital operation of the turbine controls is a system that the industry has gone through, that the operators have gotten Gotten, they've seen and know of the new ones, and these systems just make the job much easier to operate. Yeah, the operators are included in the, uh, the design phase up front. All of the smart team to uh, get their input on uh, what the end user is going to uh, expect. And even with the tornado missile project, which uh, you know, by design doesn't have a lot of moving parts, but just you know, the operators, in particular fire brigade, being able to still access you know, areas of the plant. Uh, that might or could potentially get obstructed with some of the physical work we've done out there. You know, we found it's important from, you know, especially the field operators that are going to be out there in the plant, you know, maneuvering around that equipment that kept them engaged in that design phase by the processes is Mr. Swanson mentioned. And one of the items I'm going to talk about next, Tony, is diesel generator voltage regulators. The operators are involved in the design and the testing of that equipment to ensure increased reliability in the future of our diesel generators. What are you doing to ensure that the operation, if you put a new control system, right? It's not been quite, it's not been operational yet, but how are you ensuring that they're trained up to be ready? So one of the things we completed approximately a month ago is what we called fast cruise training. When we took the operators from the startup to the plant all the way through operation and a real live time uh, pace of the uh, evolutions. And also what we'll do, Tony, for example, what we just did uh, about three days ago, just in time training, when we did the evolution of going down to mid-loop to an RCS vacuum fill. We did what we call just-in-time training for the operators, and that was performed event-free with our operations department. We will also do the same in the future for the major evolutions where we will perform. And I had to ask a question about simulated development. The simulated training? brought along as well? Absolutely, yes. Uh, the uh, training staff goes to the uh, plant once a week and walks down the uh, main control board and compares that to the simulator. The simulator staff is also engaged with all the design changes. <coughs> They're familiar and can keep it up to date with the plant. When I went into the simulator on Sunday morning, when operations was draining the vessel down the reactor system, cooling system down for mid loop to pull a vacuum, I had nuclear oversight and control room. I had the ops management in control room. I was in the control room. Training was in the control room. We had a peer from uh, one of the Exelon plants uh, in the control room. So we had the proper oversight, experience levels, and we had the instructors in there so they could have taken directly see how the evolution went to apply for learnings in the future. Okay. Uh, thank you. While we're on the topic of, of operations, I'm, I'm curious if you can describe for me uh, you know, how many operator burdens you currently have in place and I guess whatever that number is what number do you think you'll have prior to restart? Yeah, the uh, screening right now has 39 uh, on the list and that covers a, break, uh, a range uh, that's broken out by tiers from uh, the highest is one with a uh, component cooling water flow instrument uh, that they would uh, use for uh, testing the, uh, the pumps down to enunciators or uh, control board indications that uh, aren't as we expect. 
Um, the number that we would uh, project to have when we come bring the unit back online on our 19th. And I'm, and I'm curious, uh, of these 39, how many have been there since, I guess, the last time we shut down? I don't have that number in, off the top of my head, uh, but we have brought the number down from over 60. Yeah, and Mr. Swanson will touch you know, additionally on operational readiness, but it really hit a key component of operational focus where you know, we've improved the shift manager in particular leadership role in, in directing you know, not only emergent work but driving scheduled work for the station, in particular operator burdens, as you mentioned, where we keep a small dedicated team of what's called Fix It Now in the maintenance organization to go prioritize and, and go solve those issues for the operators. And that's an important piece of, of their leadership development as well as the operators demonstrating uh, you know, that they're truly in charge of day-to-day -day operations. Okay, slide seven, please. We've made, we have made many additional plant reliability enhancements. The voltage regulator for the station emergency diesel generators was replaced to ensure we have a reliable operation in the event of an emergency and these diesel generators are required. The old equipment was obsolete and the spare parts were not available. We tested the new equipment and it performs better than the original equipment. <laughs> Hundreds of parts and components have been replaced during the equipment service life uh, project. We replaced and refurbished major components in the reactor protection system to improve its reliability. We overhauled the raw water pumps and motors and we upgraded the cables in the equipment at manholes 5 and 31. We rewound the motor for the electric driven auxiliary feed pump to address age-related degradation and enhanced reliability. We also rewound, rewound the generator stator and installed new stator bars, circuit ring buses, and the end winding support system. The project also included the installation of a new generator monitoring and analyzer system and new instrumentation. In addition, we did major work on an electrical distribution system to enhance its reliability we replaced or overhauled all 4160 volt circuit breakers. The troubleshooting and repair or replacement of these breakers was a good example of teamwork between engineering and electrical maintenance. All these significant plant improvements will result in a safer and more reliable plant. I'm now going to turn the presentation over to Scott Swanson. Thank you, Mike. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Again, my name is Scott Swanson. I am the Site Operations Director for Fort Calvin. I have over 35 years experience in the industry, including 20 years as a licensed operator. I was also a member of an industry group that performed evaluations and assessments of nuclear power plants around the country. On slide eight, you'll see... How much slide might be closer? How's that? That's better. <laughs> Thank you. On July 29th, we reloaded the reactor core with nuclear fuel. Prior to the fuel transfer, completed all the necessary surveillances, testing, and ensured that the equipment that was operating as required. We trained and qualified all the operators and personnel supporting the field movers, and they functioned effectively as a team to accomplish the work. Training qualifications and adhering to procedures are the cornerstone for task execution by our people. We accomplished the fuel movement using guidance developed by the reactor engineers to place the fuel in a specific pattern to support lower power physics testing and eventual reactor restart. The reactor head was fully tensioned on August 25th. Slide 9. With the fuel reloaded, the reactor internals reassembled and the head retention, the major component of the primary system has been rebuilt. The reactor coolant system has been made ready for restart. We filled the primary coolant system with water and removed air in the system. We continue to monitor and adjust the primary and chemistry to required specifications. This week we'll raise the pressure in the primary system to approximately 200 pounds of pressure per square inch to allow test runs of the reactor coolant pumps and ensure they are ready for restart. We also tested the control rods to ensure they are functioning as required as part of the reactor protection system. Slide 10. We also restored the secondary cooling system. We filled, vented, lined up feed water and condensate systems and ran those systems to flush the piping. We 
then shut down the secondary cooling system for a short period to address minor leaks on gaskets. We continue to recirculate this water from the condenser through piping and back again, continue cleaning the condensate system and maintain the chemistry parameters within specifications. Additionally, the circulating water system has been left in operation. Slide 11, we use many types of power to operate pumps, valves, and control systems at Fort Calhoun. We have tested both AC and DC electrical systems in multiple configurations using power sources from outside the station and internally from emergency diesel generators. As Mike mentioned, we have performed many modifications and upgrades. The electrical system is no exception. We reviewed the system and equipment designs and made necessary modifications to enhance and improve reliability. These electrical systems have remained available throughout the extended outage and have been aligned to support power needs for testing, removed for system, uh, removed from service and deliberate and controlled outages for maintenance to work safely on the electrical components. Slide 12. After maintenance and modifications, we restored and aligned the emergency core cooling system. We filled vented piping systems and we made multiple test runs to demonstrate that the emergency core cooling system would provide the required flow to the reactor vessel. Mike Hay mentioned this. We achieved proper flow balance in modified systems with flow orifices and performed post-modification tests to confirm the performance standards are being met. Supporting these emergency core cooling systems are the raw water and component cooling water systems, which are also run and ensure performance requirements are being satisfied. Together, these pumps, pipes, and valves are supporting safe operation of the plant. Collectively, these significant systems have been tested, reviewed, and re-reviewed by the Fort Calhoun team that includes operators, maintenance, and engineering personnel. Specific acceptance criteria have been applied and continued performance expectations are in place and will be monitored to ensure sustained performance and equipment reliability. Slide 13. People remain at the center of our plans and define our performance as a team. A key member of the team is my shift managers. Besides being the senior licensed holder on shift, the shift manager and his crew monitor plant operation for adverse trends and concerns. The station uses a plan of the day meeting for the shift managers to drive safety, the station's operational focus, and teamwork across the organization. The shift managers have many processes at their disposal to ensure consistent operational focus is applied. OPPD has adopted industry best practices to support operational decision making. In a recent example, a system engineer identified two incompatible creases in a cooling fan motor on top of the reactor head. The team used the operational decision-making process to identify and evaluate options. The result was the addition of a maintenance outage to remove these fans, disassemble the motor bearings, clean, inspect, re-pack them, and reinstall the bearings with the best reason for this high temperature environment. This ensures high equipment reliability for the shift manager and the crew, and is an example of how we use processes and tool as tools to ensure the best and safest decisions. Risk is another area that the operators are in charge of for assessing every day. The risk program uses tools to assess risk whether the unit is in an outage or if it is online. The program has the operators considering what if and anticipate system responses during planned evolutions, scheduled maintenance, and even employment weather. These actions by the operating crews led by the shift manager result in functional areas being integrated into an effective team that supports safe operation. Slide 14. Consolidating and coordinating activities between departments is central to our restart plan. Event 3 performance within operations is our cornerstone. This involves trained operators with clear expectations, executing pre-planned tasks with procedure adherence. Our performance is critiqued regularly and the shift managers use crew clocks to track performance. Examples of these clocks are shown in the picture on the right. Shift crews have taken upon themselves to have advocates in the areas of safety and human performance. These individuals have a passion for error-free operations. They coach and challenge the crew to seek excellence in their performance. The operators have benchmarked the industry to stay current with plans having proven capabilities most recently this month. These trips complement assessments done on our performance and procedures. Training is also used 
used by the shift managers to drive performance. As Mike mentioned, the operating crews have sent their licensed operators through a fast cruise training session that exercised crew dynamics with the unit at power that included scheduled activities and equipment failures. This allowed drilling them on risk assessment and priority setting. When these issues arose, the operators used the corrective action program to communicate and track issue resolution to their satisfaction. The simulator is a valuable tool for the station and allows for specific activities to be trained on just in time to ensure the procedures, actions, and responsibilities are understood and exercised before key activities begin. As the operations director, I attended a working group meeting in Atlanta to review current industry issues. At this meeting, I obtained commitment from my peers to support observations and our performance in the field and the control room. Experienced individuals from the industry will provide mentoring and a fresh perspective as we heat up the plan and continue to test the systems. The senior leadership team will also provide oversight to ensure expectations and standards are met. Mr. Swanson. Yes, sir. I, you mentioned, at least I think you mentioned, I'm on, I'm on slide 14, is that where you're at? Good. Yeah. Uh, benchmarking operating plans. Can you can you discuss for, for me what you learned by doing that activity and what deltas you found between you know those sites and yours and what what actions that the plants take yeah um the experience was valuable for the operators it got them to uh, acclimate to the, uh, the facilities that are in service the noise the temperature the the, the, the feel of the plant uh, they were able to uh, monitor and look at plant processes and compare uh, equipment performance against rounds and what was expected what they were actually seeing the uh, personnel in the control room were able to review the uh, uh, standards that are in place. The insistence that you use the procedures, that you track uh, the performance and the, and the status of the equipment, the uh, command and control structure that uh, uh, others use, and they were able to bring that back and model our behaviors after some of those. Mr. Vega, we had a uh, um, SRO from one of the Exelon plants from the Midwest come to the site, and uh, he is in charge of the Fix It Now team, which is led by operations at one of those plants. And he came to our site here, and he sat down with the operators, at, and it's operations led with the maintenance people, and he showed them the proper behaviors and processes and how to implement that team, which is essential for the uh, operating department. That was a good example where we were able to incorporate risk assessment tools in uh, taking equipment, aligning it for maintenance, and then bringing it back. Thank you. Slide 15. Procedures are a key element of the process for event free operation. Feedback from the regulators and others was taken in a comprehensive recovery project taken on to correct, improve, and upgrade procedures. The breadth of this project included reviews of all of the enunciator response procedures and revisions to add detail and correct errors. These enunciator response procedures provide the operator with critical information early on to address conditions outside of prescribed parameters. Procedures were also reviewed and revised to provide additional detail for operators to ensure their actions were consistent should the plant enter abnormal or emergency operating conditions. Supporting specific equipment manipulations are done using operating instructions. These were also prioritized and included in the recovery project to align the new emergency and abnormal procedures as well as give guidance for normal operator actions. The recovery project is complete and the procedures are available to the operators to clarify actions they are expected to take, provide additional technical details, and incorporate new formatting. The procedures are so important to the operators that additional revisions will continue even after restart to keep pace with industry standard add clarification to aid for those who use them regularly and to reflect design and facility changes that are made. The procedures go beyond those used by the operator for any equipment and include administrative procedures that dictate how process will be applied. I mentioned such an example with the operation of decision making process for the fan bearings. The illus this illustrates one of the steps as a station systematically works through our integration to the Exelon nuclear management model. Ultimately, the procedures will be set to meet industry best. 
I will now turn the presentation over to Ron Short. Thank you, Scott. Uh, slide 16, please. Good evening. I'm Ron Short, the Assistant Engineering Director at Fort Calhoun. Can you hear me? Not really. All right. Let's get a closer assessment. Is that better? Can you hear me out? Closer. Yeah, it goes in and out, and it seems like as you move your voice pattern away from it, it just drops. Let's try this. You can lean forward. I'm going to spend a few minutes discussing the key guiding principles and fundamentals we have instilled in engineering. Also, I'll be discussing engineering improvements we have implemented to support a safe startup, and then we'll continue our drive towards excellence during power operations. As noted on this slide, we have made our expectations crystal clear to the engineering staff that nuclear safety is our number one priority. Closely behind this priority is a site operational focus, which means engineering has a bias for action, is a team player with all departments, and that our staff has an intolerance for equipment failures. Using good human performance skills is an important element in producing quality engineering products. An example here is the expectation to have the procedure open and to refer to it during the conduct of an engineering task, or having the procedure in hand, as we like to call it. Technical human performance is also an area where we have established clear expectations. Engineers use their specialized education and training in doing their daily jobs. This knowledge-based work is more challenging to verify that the work is completed correctly. We require that assumptions and methods used are clearly and completely documented and that the engineer's work is reviewed by other engineering personnel. Next, I would like to discuss the key principles we have instituted in engineering. In order to have good performance in any department, a foundation of detailed procedures, rigorous processes, and knowledgeable people is necessary. We have refreshed our conduct of engineering roles and responsibilities to make it clear who we'll owns each engineering program, process, and function. We have defined the fundamental behaviors we expect of our engineers and have emphasized that engineering has the primary responsibility of being a technical safety conscious at Fort Collins Station. Finally, we have emphasized the use of the Corrective Action Program as a tool to further improve our performance. Our engineers have been trained on these principles and fundamental behaviors, and we expect that these principles are complied with. Slide 17, please. Experience, leadership, and supervision is critical to having a strong engineering division. We have significantly enhanced the senior engineering leadership at the station. Our current engineering director has over 35 years of engineering experience. Also, we have brought in other excellent engineering directors to help drive performance improvement in our engineering division. In addition, we have filled the open manager positions in the design engineering and programs engineering departments. Our design engineering department has had a heavy workload of recovery and startup work. To strengthen oversight of design engineering, we have added a second supervisor in both the mechanical and electrical design areas. Finally, excellent fleet engineering experts are frequently used by our engineering staff to challenge proposed technical solutions or to obtain support for a unique technical issue. As I mentioned previously, our design engineering staff has a large workload and we supplement our staff with engineering specialists as needed. Slide 18, please. Strong engineering performance requires appropriate staffing levels with trained and qualified personnel. We have made very good progress in the past year in staffing and qualifications. We have implemented the excellent certification guide process for our newly hired engineers. The certification guides ensure our new engineers are fully trained and qualified to properly execute their responsibilities. We will replace our existing task qualification card process the excellent certification guide process later this year for our experienced engineering staff. We now have 22 trained and qualified system engineers or five system engineers in the qualification process. That compares to only seven qualified system engineers in 2012. All but two design engineers are qualified for these further positions and these two engineers will complete their qualifications this fall. 
Finally, all but three program engineers were qualified, with two of these engineers being recent hires. While our engineers are in training to learn how to complete their specific task at Fort Campbell, they are mentored by fully qualified engineers and their supervisors. Only when the engineer is fully qualified on a task can the engineer perform the task of that task independently. I also wanted to mention that many of our new system engineers have not seen Fort Campbell Station in a startup or operating role. To compensate for this, we have paired up the new engineers with an experienced senior system engineer as a mentor. Also, the system engineering supervisors have extensive experience in Fort Campbell and will be heavily involved in startup activities. Lastly, we plan to bring in experienced system engineers from excellent plants during startup to assist us. We have also developed a training excellence plan to drive improvement in the engineering training area. The two key activities in this plan are to one, ensure engineering line management is actively engaged in and fully owns the engineering training program. And two, that training is used to continuously improve our engineering performance. This includes not only training on power plant and engineering fundamentals, but on lessons learned for tasks that went well or to learn from areas that don't fully meet our expectations. This is your one quick question. Yeah, in operations, they talk about benchmarking other sites and the folks out there, other sites to get the, the field board operating plan. Have you done the same in the engineering area the, for system engineers? This is what it's done. Yes, the system engineers have been out to a couple of operating excellent plans, Mr. Bingo. Okay. To gain that experience and get a feel for what it's like for an operating plan. Did you get any feedback from them after they came back? Yes, we did. They had to write a trip report. But it, was, it was positive feedback. It was positive feedback. Right. But anything that they brought back that it said, hey, we ought to apply? Any, any learnings from that? Any specifics? Uh, yeah, one of the key ones I think they brought back is the importance of equipment monitoring during, during operations. Slide 19, please. Question. Um, to what extent are all of your systems engineers qualified to do uh, operability determinations and 50-59 screens to support operations and the timely completion of those? Mr. Markley, in our process, our, our design engineering staff normally prepares the operability evaluations. And, uh, most of the design engineers are, are qualified to perform operability evaluations. We have uh, narrowed the population, uh, particularly in 50-59, to make sure the expertise is, is applied properly. And we use the senior folks for those documents. And then, uh, in addition, there's multiple layers of review. But one of the actions that we took for the 50-59 process and for operability was to keep the population relatively narrow so we knew the experienced folks uh, were doing those documents. What, what percentage of your design engineers are 50-59 screen qualified? Well, like Mr. Rash had indicated, we've reduced the population. We currently have about 12 or 13 uh, engineers that are currently qualified and are authorized to do that. We have more that are qualified to do it, but we have backed it down to a limited number of people that can perform those evaluations. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, slide 19, please. Finally, to augment line supervision and management review of engineering work and to ensure we are consistently generating high quality technical products, we formed the Engineering Assurance Group, or EAG, in late 2012. The EAG provides independent oversight of engineering by reviewing completed technical products such as modifications, safety evaluations, and operability evaluations. The EAG was strengthened in spring 2013 by adding new personnel to the group and ensuring expectations and accountabilities were clear. The AG currently consists of outside experienced design engineers and senior reactor operators. Comments from the AG reviews are fed back to the engineers and their supervisors to improve the engineers and supervisor performance. We maintain weekly performance indicators that track and trend the quality of the technical products that the AG reviews. Performance indicators are used by engineering management to focus additional attention where necessary to further improve technical product quality. The 
The AG will remain in place until the engineering director is satisfied that engineering is consistently producing high quality products and recommends to station management that this augmented independent oversight is no longer necessary. I'd now like to turn the presentation over to Bruce Rash who will discuss what we're doing in the area of design and licensing basis. Let me just ask a quick question here. Um, how, how do you determine what the key technical products are that you have reviewed by this group? What do, how, how do you make that determination? If I understand your question this one correctly, it's <coughs> essentially review all key engineering products and procedural and all of our station procedures. I, I would just sort of try and figure out what, what, what sort of defines what, what key stuff is or what, what you would determine. Does that make sense? Okay. I'll answer that. So uh, the key calculations, uh, any modifications, uh, operability evaluations, 50, 59 products, and any uh, large engineering studies, uh, we require all of those products to be reviewed by EAG or an independent third party uh, engineering review uh, prior to giving those to the operations staff for implementation. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to, my name's Bruce Rash. I'd like to provide an update on design and licensing basis uh, activities. As we've discussed previously, the design and licensing basis control area was identified as a fundamental performance deficiency in 2012. In 2012, we did perform a root cause and the actions uh, that came out of that were largely uh, the items that Ron talked about in improving the conduct of engineering, uh, developing more fully and completely the roles and responsibilities of the engineering staff, and in ensuring that uh, the engineers understood their roles in, in the use of CAP. Uh, additionally, uh, since October 2012, other items have been identified. We performed a, another root cause in the spring of 2013, and in that root cause, we went back to the construction permit days in 1968 all the way to the current day in the plan. And what we identified was that there was a need to reconstitute the design and licensing basis for the station. Slide 21, please actions that we've completed. Uh, we have developed a key calculation review project that includes the key calculations for the plant, and this includes mechanical, civil, structural, and electrical calculations. Uh, we have completed phase one of that project and continue in phase two. Uh, this is a long-term project that will continue for several years to review these calculations. We've trained the engineers and the operators and utilizing the current design and licensing basis, uh, both in the operability determination process and 5059 evaluations uh, for safety screening and evaluations. And that's uh, what I talked about previously with NARO and that population to ensure that we have the highly skilled folks uh, and experience performing those documents. We perform uh, many uh, structural walk-downs of the safety-related systems to ensure consistency with the design drawings. And uh, if discrepancies were identified, those were en entered into the corrective action program and corrected. And we continue, as Ron talked about, monitoring engineering and operator work product quality through the engineering assurance group. And now I'd like to go to slide 22 to talk about actions going forward for the design and licensing basis uh, reconstitution. Uh, part of this project will include developing a very detailed project plan uh, that will include benchmarking other facilities, uh, the document scanning uh, with modern technology for character rec uh, recognition so that we can word search those documents and or easily retrieve them. Uh, in, the, in the project plan, we will have a pilot uh, that will develop the project controls and the methodology for reviewing system and generic issues uh, like the general design criteria, uh, licensing basis elements, and then PRA insights. 
and we'll take that pilot and and then uh, make any adjustments that we need before we do the full-blown project. Uh, right now, we're in the the pre-bid process of developing a plan. Uh, that item uh, is under construction right now. Uh, our plan is to use expert resources from the industry, along with uh, some of our own staff engineers so that we can retain the knowledge that's gained through doing the project and not lose that to a contractor that leaves the site when they're done. Uh, we will continue the key calculation uh, project uh, and as I said previously the documents will be included in a searchable database uh, so that we can easily retrieve those uh, pieces of the design and licensing basis and use those in engineering documents going forward. Uh, we will continue to train the station staff on the use of the new uh, program as it's developed. And in addition to provide defense in depth, we will be doing annual risk significant system uh, deep dive reviews of design, much like uh, we did for Ox Feedwater for the component design basis inspection uh, pre work. Uh, it's very detailed uh, work with experts in the industry. And in addition, as we've talked about previously, we'll, we will maintain the engineering assurance group in place uh, to ensure uh, high product quality uh, in the current day. I'd now like to turn the presentation over to Lou for a discussion on sustained performance. Thanks, Bruce. Again, I'll provide an update on our post-restart plan for sustained improvement. And that began with me establishing the performance improvement policy for Fort Calhoun, and then subsequently the procedures and processes. And you heard several examples tonight as, as you see the team referring to training and benchmarking as well as the corrective action program. Uh, but it also includes our use of industry operating experience, how we learn from other issues in the industry, as well as trending of our lower level issues. One other key component of our performance improvement is the performance improvement integrated matrix or the term PIM. And that's the tool that we've used to establish our plan for sustained improvement. It's a proven process we've used across the Exelon fleet. It's very predictable, reliable, and I appreciate it. It really allows us to effectively provide oversight of the process because it's directly tied to the corrective action program computerized system which provides the foundation for the actions that we're completing such that as something gets completed or something gets moved or something gets adjusted, it facilitates easy oversight of that process. And also form the basis for the plan for sustained improvement that we docketed, excuse me, revision zero, submitted that to the NRC on July 29th of this year. Next slide. So the, the plan for sustained improvement really allows us to continue the momentum that we've achieved through the recovery phase of the station. Currently has 82 fleet site or department level action plans that are owned by respective line managers at the site. And, and as I mentioned the oversight, it, it's really threefold right now. Uh, the senior leadership team, uh, we currently review weekly progress that we're making across those action plans. The OPPD and Exelon corporate executives are afforded an opportunity to challenge progress during our periodic management review meetings. And that nuclear oversight and our independent nuclear safety review board will also provide independent oversight of the progress. But really the bottom line is that we will not close out action plans until the senior leadership team concludes that the gap that we're trying to fix is truly fixed uh, with measurable you know, metrics right now and, and, a, and a method to sustain that performance going forward. Slide 25 has the, an important subset, which we call the key drivers for achieving and sustaining excellence. In the previous meetings, we've spent quite a bit of time talking about organizational effectiveness, safety culture, safety conscious work environment, uh, problem identification and resolution, and we continue to make progress across each of those areas. Uh, we touched on a little bit tonight, performance improvement, design licensing basis, operational focus, procedures, equipment performance and some key engineering programs and, uh, and we'll hear briefly from Kerry Enan, our nuclear oversight manager on nuclear oversight. So I really want to spend just a little bit of time talking about where we're at with respect to transition to the Exelon nuclear management model and integration into the fleet and that truly is the, the foundation for sustaining improvement and, and, and really 
means of early detection should we, uh, should we have a performance issues going forward. Slide 25 is kind of a high-level Exelon philosophy. And when we talk about the nuclear management model, in part it consists or talks about the necessary policies, procedures, and programs, but it truly is driven from the leadership. And we are seeing early results. For example, at 8 o'clock every morning the station is on in conjunction with the other six west, midwest plants, uh, accountable to our plant performance over the prior 24 hours. Not only do we get the benefit of hearing what's going on at the other stations in the Midwest fleet, uh, but we get the executives uh, from the corporation challenging on the work that we're doing, the progress that we're making, and if we've had issues overnight, uh, what help do we need? And so it not only provides a governance and oversight function for us, but really that support and perform function is the other half of what's important about being a fleet. So that strong, intrusive leadership, passion for excellence, and as we'll talk uh, in a little bit more detail, the effect of independent oversight, and that's really where we believe will be cemented uh, is the implementation of that model is what will drive excellence and continued performance improvement at the station. Next slide. Just high level again, uh, progress towards full implementation of the model. We've heard several examples of early implementation, whether it was uh, Mr. Swanson talking about operational decision making or procedure improvements or some of the other tools that we've talked about with improving engineering. But it's, it's a five phase, five phase process. Uh, over 25,000 person hours currently invested in, in an analyzing and developing the framework, which is our comparison to an Exelon single unit site. The design, which is comparing 27 functional areas at the site, that's everything from operations to maintenance to radiation protection to chemistry to engineering. Uh, that design comparison will be completed in October of this year, and that will form the foundation of the implementation plan, which will be completed by the end of this year. And, and, and again, it'll, as we lay out what that looks like, will be substantially complete in 2014, but as we work with uh, the overall plan, we anticipate full implementation of the management model uh, by 2015. Um, it also includes, includes executive challenges by both OPPD and Exelon. And, and it's interesting, as we've done even the design phase, and looked at processes and, and things that, uh, ways of doing business at Fort Calhoun, part of that process of, of integration also takes some of the good practices that we used at Fort Calhoun we're able to take that and even strengthen the management model uh, with, respects to the, with respects to the integration. So let, that's it from a high level. Again, the, the nuclear management model is truly the foundation for what excellence looks like going forward and, and is going to be our, our path for achieving the second part of our vision statement. So with that, I will turn the presentation over to Kerry Ian and our nuclear oversight manager. Thank you, Lou, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kerry Rainen. I am the Nuclear Oversight Manager at OPPD. I've talked to you at these public meetings regarding the improved and strengthened independent oversight at Fort Calhoun. Tonight I will update you on an independent perspective. One of the elements of the independent oversight is the Nuclear Oversight Department that reports directly to me. This team of 20 individuals conducts assessments, audits, and inspections of all aspects of activities conducted at the site. The Nuclear Oversight Team continues to assess the station's readiness for startup. The Oversight Team developed a plan for integrated restart readiness, and that plan has five major elements. First is program compliance. Second is management and human performance excellence plans. Third is system health assurance. Fourth is the restart checklist review. And fifth is startup health insurance. The Nuclear Oversight has completed 90% of the elements of this restart assessment. The issues that have been identified in this assessment have been entered into the Corrective Action Program and have been addressed by the station staff. Using similar criteria as the NRC uses to evaluate issues, none of these recent issues have been safety significant. My team has also completed an engineering audit and an operations audit in the past two months using the audit templates that the Exelon fleet uses to measure performance at all the sites. All issues identified have been entered in the Corrective Action Program and are being addressed by station staff. A maintenance audit starts next week. These audits ensure that all regulatory requirements are met and evaluate performance to industry excellence. Another element of independent oversight of Fort Calhoun is the Nuclear Safety Review Board. 
This collegial board of independent experts reports directly to the OPPD chief executive officer and to the board of directors. During their most recent visit, they noted the work that has been done to address the issues required for re restarts. They evaluated the various departments in Fort Calhoun and determined that those departments were ready for restart. All of the issues identified by the Nuclear Safety Review Board at this last meeting were of low safety significance and entered into the Corrective Action Program and have been addressed by station personnel. These independent oversight perspectives from the Nuclear Safety Review Board and from the Nuclear Oversight Department will continue to ensure that the station is ready for restart and that after restart is operated safely in the future. I'll now turn it back over to Lou for closing comments. Thank you, Mr. Eden. I'll leave you with a, a couple of key messages that I'd like to close with. First of all, that OPPD has improved the safety margins of Fort Calhoun Station and it's ready for a safe and efficient restart. And that started with addressing the overarching causes of performance decline that included organizational effectiveness, safety culture, safety conscious work environment, the adequacy of our corrective action program, and as just discussed, our independent oversight. And as documented and as discussed not only here but also in uh, at the region in August, our commitment to implementing the plan for sustained improvement, which, which, which is our driver to achieving excellence post-restart. So again, we do appreciate the opportunity tonight and was able to illustrate these key messages through the updates that we provided on the significant improvements in plant design and reliability, the preparation for the plant, the people in the process for heat up, some insights on work that we're doing with respect to our engineering performance, and again, an update on our plan for sustained improvement and the key transition to the Exelon nuclear management model and integration. And I always appreciate the independent oversight and assessment from Mr. Heenan and his team. Again, all tied to our renewed vision, mission, and values at the station. So with that, I'll turn the meeting back over to Mr. Bailey. Thank you very much. Really appreciated of the areas that you covered. You, know, you talked about the people, you talked about the equipment, and you talked about the process, what steps you're taking. And there's some things that are really you know, incurred, uh, both from the equipment perspective and what you're doing to get the, the operators ready. So, and we see it too, the type of issues that you've identified and are addressing. And I think we see it too, just the physical, physically at the plant, there is a difference. But, I mean, we're still not done from our perspective. And you when know, you say ready for restart, there is still work that needs to be done at, at the plant physically. Modifications that do have to be completed and that we will independently evaluate to make sure that the issues are addressed, right? There will be some other independent assessments that we will conduct that, yes, we have completed our review of several areas. Uh, we talked about safety culture. Uh, we talked about the quality organization that we even, but we've assessed that. We said, yeah, that was good. But there's other areas remaining still, you know, that we, we will do an independent evaluation to, to make sure that it's that. The other thing is I would encourage you to keep asking questions. You know, we're seeing it in the report yesterday. If something doesn't look right, document it and throw it back. That's the key. You know, we, when we first started talking about Fort Calhoun, the recovery, the step one was discovery. This, you know, where we discovered all the problems. And I would, I would say, probably never get done discovery. I would encourage you to need a look. Because whatever could be done to make more Calhoun safe, to make the, the safety margin as safe as possible, I think it's key. We need both our goals is safe operation plan, you know, today and possibly in the future. So with that, I think we'll try to take a 10 minute uh, break and uh, next we'll be answering questions. Thank you. As you're getting settled, reminder, you have no cards.
if you do not feel comfortable coming to the mic or you just would rather have your card, your question read, I do have no cards and there are still some on the table. We'll be getting started soon. Like I said, we'll either end at 9 or until the question and answer portion is over, whichever, whichever comes first. And I would like to set some ground rules that we've used here and they seem to work pretty well. We would like to give everyone that wants to speak an opportunity to be heard. So please, make your statement brief. If you have prepared a long speech, please keep it down to one or two minutes or summarize it so that we can get to everyone. If you have several points you would like to make, Please make one or two and come back after everyone else has had an opportunity to speak. If during your question it becomes a back and forth interchange with either one of the folks from NRC or OPPD, we'll cut that short and then ask if you to ask your question after the meeting has adjourned. Again, the purpose of this meeting is to focus on the safe operation of Fort Count Home. Let's stray away from any fiscal matters with OPPD. Those type of questions may be best handled at one of the OPPD board meetings. However, if it is an urgent meeting, oh, excuse me, an urgent question, OPPD Public Affairs is here and you're welcome to speak with them after the meeting. As for the layout, we can form a line here and you can ask your question of the folks up front or if you would like to stand in your seat, stay in your seat, raise your hand and I'll come to you. And I also have a few note cards that I will read on behalf of some of the members here. Lastly, I would like to emphasize respect. We have a lot of differing opinions here, both for and against nuclear power. Let's please keep it civil and respect each other. With that said, let's go ahead and begin. First question. Good evening. Uh, thanks for having these uh, forum and meetings again. Uh, my name is Mike Carberry. I'm with the uh, Sierra Club, uh, the Sierra Club's uh, Nuclear Free Campaign, which is a national campaign uh, that is uh, trying to move us beyond nuclear power. So obviously you, you, you know my perspective. I noticed that you closed out um, the yellow finding on flooding, and it was done last week, which was all strangely coincidental or ironic that we had massive flooding in Colorado. And uh, you were talking about, uh, you know, beyond design basis that you are uh, protecting us from flood, but that would be massively beyond. Now, we've been told that there are six uh, dams on the Missouri River uh, above Omaha. And now with climate change, we are seeing this sort of uh, weather disruption, bad weather, massive flooding, drought, all sorts of things like this. And uh, how are we, uh, supposed to feel comfortable that if something like what happened in Colorado within the last couple weeks happened on the upper uh, Missouri River uh, Basin, if that happened, that we wouldn't uh, have cascading dam failure and uh, have Fort Calhoun Station be under 50 foot of water. Have you looked at 50 feet of water? That's my question. Well, I think the first thing I wanted to ask is, uh, the person here up front that's setting up his camera. Is it possible that you can stay in your seats? Well, he asked me to move. They have a cameraman. He asked me to move my camera because it was in his shot to get you. So I'm actually responding to the crew. Okay. Okay. I didn't, I didn't just jump up for no reason. So, you know, I'm, I'm not insane. I'm okay. The camera people are working together because we're like that. Yeah, yeah I, I think that I want to uh, actually say something to begin with. Um, and, you know, the, the exact things that you talk about are the things that we discuss with the Army Corps of Engineers, which is um, the entity that manages the dams, you know, on the river. And, you know, this is something that um, 
you know, we also have a very um, strong interest and in, is um, making sure that the, um, you know, the integrity of the dams, um, looking at uh, the possible scenarios and um, understanding what the scenarios are that the plan needs to protect against, what should be in their licensing basis, and also, you know, the, these particular uh, scenarios work, which go beyond the um, design and licensing basis. So these are all things that we look at. These are all things that we consider. In fact, you know, we also have a group um, back at headquarters that is looking at this, not just for Fort Calhoun, but for all the plants, because all the plants have their unique situation, their unique design. And, you know, I understand what you're saying about, you know, Colorado. And, you know, it, it's not just the every day you've got to think about it. It's also the scenarios that go beyond. Um, so that we have a group that is um, looking at um, this situation for all the plants. And also, um, there's a reanalysis being done within the context of um, what, they're, what they've been asked to look at. Um, so you know, there, there's a lot of work underway. But in the interim, what we're trying to do is make sure that the, the licensing basis and what we're protecting against is robust enough for today as well. So you know, there's actually two things that are going on. One is the current day, and another is looking at a reanalysis that um, is going to be submitted next year and um, the reviews. And if they indicate even more that needs to be done, then that's what we would um, also expect as well. Thank you. I'd like to read one of the comment cards. What has the NRC done to verify that the new Exelon managers understand the unique four camera licensing basis, design basis, and technical specifications? Uh, if, if you look on the NRC document for Fort Calhoun, we, we did do a review of the management agreements between Fort Calhoun and or OBBD and Exelon. And then we issued a letter stating that within the regulations in CFR 5080 for ownership and control, we do not have a problem with the arrangement that they have. And OPBD remains the licensed entity that is responsible for safe operation and knowledge of the design and licensing basis. Thank you. Can Mr. Mark, I'd just like to build a, a little bit on that. You know, as, as Mr. Swanson talked about the shift manager and the senior licensing individuals on shift as well as uh, one of Mr. Swanson's direct reports is the senior license for the site. So that license knowledge is, uh, is well embedded in the operations department as well as the leadership development that we have focused on. And so while we provide you know, an opportunity to, to have our operations department you know, use the technical expertise of the fleet, uh, by no means does that uh, you know, advocate for, for or in any way dilute what the licensed operators are, are licensed to do for the station is to make those technical decisions um, you know, for the plant as well as the, you know, the technical conscience for the station. Thank you. Hi, my name is Brian King. I live in Missouri Valley, Iowa, which is in the evacuation zone. Um, my question is about the karst formations and cascading failures and the, uh, the idea in risk management that you have to multiply various risks that, you, and, that you're entertaining in a given operation. So what you have in Fort Calhoun is uh, a known geographic, uh, geological defect known as karst formations that was kind of um, glossed over when it was originally built, not informed to the public, but now we understand that this is it's a formation that can cause sinkholes. So you add the possibility of sinkholes on top of the construction defects that weren't up to spec, and then you add into that potential for floods, exacerbating the karst formations that nobody knows what what situation they're at today since flooding. And we're only examined when the, when the plant was built 50 some years ago, whatever that was. So you're, you're really just assuming, you know, they're making big assumptions that the plant operation is safe based on various analysis that's done by people that have vested interest of that plant going operation. I would suggest that we need to take a broader look at all of the potential failures, flood, uh, dam failures, earthquakes, known defects of the geological um, uh, underlaying the foundation of that plan. 
and say, does it really make sense for it to go into operation? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. I'm uh, John Pollock. Uh, I would like to uh, add on to the uh, comments of the first gentleman uh, with reference to uh, action number 4.4 and 3.2, review flood design bases and determine if the 2011 flood event provides additional information that should drive design basis changes. To me as a meteorologist, with uh, 30 years of forecasting experience, what I learned from this event was number one, it wouldn't have taken something greatly larger in magnitude to cause a dam failure than what we already had in 2011, because they had to let that water run down the system, whether it was weakening the dam structure or not. They couldn't hold very much back in that situation. Uh, this puts the possibility of a dam failure in something of the same order of probability as a direct hit from a tornado, which is something that you're already preparing for. It's not a likely hazard, but it's sufficiently possible that you can see a need to prepare for it. And I think that this is of roughly the same order of magnitude. Uh, we already did have a larger flood in 1881. And those of you who flew in here might have noticed that you crossed through a little piece of Iowa getting from the airport to downtown. The reason you did that is because before the 1881 flood, the Missouri River ran through there and it looped back. And that flood was big enough to cut off that loop so that what is now dry land was a run over was the main channel of the Missouri River. That was a bigger one than we had last year. That was a bigger one than we had in 1952, which was why the dam system was put in. Uh, I thank you for your time, and I trust that you will be what you say, independent and thorough, and look at this problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mike Ryan. Uh, I'm here tonight as a spokesperson for Clean Nebraska. Uh, a little bit of news. Uh, a couple of things have happened uh, since the last uh, public meeting we've had here in Omaha. Uh, a couple of things. Now, they don't always make the media here, but they're big events in the, uh, the nuclear world. Uh, Vermont Yankee Nuclear Plant, of course, in the state of Vermont, is closing for economic reasons. Um, it's a merchant plant. Electricity <coughs> generated there is sold for a profit. What these merchant generators are finding throughout the country is nuclear is not the cheapest way to go anymore. It's too expensive. They have to shut down their plants when they're not making a profit. OPPD doesn't have to. They just raise the rates, which they've done 10 times in the last 10 years. Uh, another piece of news, last, uh, last meeting, uh, I and probably some other people mentioned about a uh, recent article in Bloomberg where Moody's was concerned about tornado preparedness at Fort Calhoun. Man, the quickest movement I've seen from a government agency happened right before our eyes within a week after OPPD requested a license amendment to lower the threshold uh, that one had to worry about for winds of a tornado. Uh, they got the license amendment, but sorry, that didn't do any good. Moody's has downgraded. OPPD's bond rating, and it's going to cost all the ratepayers. I didn't see that in the news. About the same time, I did see uh, a lot of reports about the city of Omaha's bond rating uh, being lowered, but nothing about OPPD. So that's going to cost us in the future. It's going to cost more to service our bonds. Um, earlier, I believe uh, Mike A mentioned something about. Uh, uh, 
high energy uh, lines that you, you're going to start taking a look at uh, uh, the high energy lines and, and uh, see if they were uh, environmentally qualified. Uh, now, when you talk about high energy lines, I think you're talking about high pressure steam lines, right? Steam and water. Uh, it's my understanding from some recent information I got that uh, there is a problem with the high energy lines. As they move from room to room through holes in walls, uh, the holes are generally much bigger than the pipes going through them. So, uh, you know, I don't know exactly what the size of the pipes, all the pipes is, are, or what the size of the hole is, but picture a six inch uh, pipe going through a 12 inch hole in the wall. If that's the case, you've got a pretty big gap. Now, if, it, if this is a particular room where there's a, a, a break in the steam line, you'd like to localize that break. You'd like it to stay within that room. If you've got these gaps uh, in these walls, uh, where there's these uh, uh, penetrations of these lines, uh, that steam's going to escape. And what happens is it can get into electrical panels and cause shorts. And you don't want electrical shorts in a nuclear plant because you start losing things like cooling and your reactor starts to heat up. Your spent fuel pool starts to heat up. You have big explosions like we have at Fukushima. So I understand from what you said, you're going to start taking a look at that. And, and I hope you see that as a problem and that you uh, deal with, uh, uh, with these gaps as they go through the walls. I I just, just to respond to that, yeah. I mean, it's not that we're going to start looking at it. We've been extensively looking at it. And I guess to clarify something, it's, it's known that there are gaps between rooms. I mean, that's by design. And, and if you read the licensee's event report a few weeks back that dealt with the health concern, it was recognized that a line break in a, in a room could affect another room, specifically the <coughs> room. So, I mean, what, what you're saying is true, but it's known, and that's what's being evaluated and resolved. And what I've heard is it's been known for quite a few years has it been dealt with. Uh, I, want to, I want to talk just, just a, a little bit about uh, uh, the dam failure of flood issue. Mr. Ryan, can we get to some of the folks and come back to you? You know, it's, it's interesting that these uh, meetings are for the public. And uh, before we get a chance to talk, uh, you put all kinds of stipulations on our testimony. But these folks, you know, you never say anything to them. There's no stipulations or or parameters that they have to follow. Well, well, frankly, actually, there are parameters. Uh, there's an understanding of how long we're going to talk. There's an understanding of how long they're going to talk so that we can provide the public with an opportunity to speak also. And so, you know, the only the only parameters we're putting on this part right now is how long each person gets to talk so that we share the opportunity amongst all of the public. We'll be sure to get back to you with yeah, I, you know, I'm willing to, to sit down and get back up, but, uh, but just the uh, the tone of the meeting, uh, the public, I think, feels very left out. You know, we sit here meeting after meeting and basically hear the same stuff from you guys. And uh, generally by then, if there's any news media, uh, they're gone, and the public never gets a chance to uh, inform the rest of the public what's going on because uh, I don't think they're going to get a true picture. First of all, you can't understand a lot of what's said because you're using Nuke speak or you're using Harvard's speak. So to the general public, it's very hard to understand. And uh, you know, I think a lot of us try and, and simplify it and make it palatable for the public, but the press, the press is wrong. Thank you. I'd like to read another note card. Slides 21 and 27 indicate five phases and only one phase is completed. So with all the delays taking place, is our civil service going to fire a dozen of you headers from NRC or OPPD? I'm 
this is a question for you. Yeah, Bruce, you want to touch on slide 21, which was uh, dealing with the key calculation review. And then uh, on slide 27, I'll touch on what we're at again with uh, integration. And I'm sorry, I was going to have you repeat the question. Slides 21 and 27 indicate five phases, and only phase one is completed. So with all of the delays taking place, is our civil service going to fire a dozen of you headers from NRC or OPPD? Bruce Thrash from uh, OPPD for the recovery. I'll answer the key count question. There are three phases to that project. Phases one and two, one is complete, that's the scoping. Two is the review. Phase three is a more detailed review. This is a process that was adopted from other plants that have been in the manual chapter 350 shutdown. We're using a known process that was accepted in the industry as a best practice. It's implemented in many of the stations throughout the country that have implemented calc improvement processes and it takes three to five years to get through that process. It will be done in conjunction with the design and licensing basis and that's the only way you can do it is to go one by one through the calculation. Yeah, and on slide 27, different topic, but it's our integration into the Exelon model. And there's actually the first two phases that are complete. The third phase, which is the design phase, is a little over 50% complete. Uh, but as, as the leader on site, they're very mindful as we do the integration. It does, it does involve work by the station personnel. So we've been as much focused on how do we provide additional oversight, and in some cases, how do we go pull forward activities that uh, we're going to do eventually, that we, that we will pull forward now that improve both the safety, uh, reliability, efficiency of the station. So as we, as we complete the next phases of, of working through heat up and ultimately start up, uh, in parallel with that, we will have completed the, the implementation phase of what do we need to focus on the remainder of 2013 and into 2014 to complete the transition. Uh, but again, as a leadership uh, and as the senior leader on site, just mindful of, of how much work that is by the site staff as we focus on, uh, on the improvement items that we discussed tonight. Thank you. I'm Wally Taylor with the uh, Sarah Club. And I had a question about the uh, even internal structures, the beams and columns that are insufficient. Um, you use the term operability as opposed to licensing basis or design basis, but it's my understanding they're going to need some significant repairs or replacements uh, because of those insufficient beams and columns. So, number one, what does operable mean? And number two, how can the plant be allowed to restart before those beams and columns are up to uh, be sufficient to carry out their, their uh, function? And when a licensee identifies a condition that's described as either non-conforming or degraded, that is in reference to how they're licensed. So, for example, you can find a non-conformance where the plant was licensed, let's say for containment structure. Uh, under these design parameters, your, your structure is, is designed and, and, and built. And when you actually go and look to see how it was built, it wasn't quite built to those standards. That would be a non-conformance. Uh, but let's take, for example, they found a lot of the rebar in the, in the uh, structure was exposed to some kind of uh, water or chemical, and it had degraded. Uh, that would be a degraded condition. Uh, for either non-conforming or degraded conditions, the licensees are able to evaluate through a process that we call operability evaluations whether or not those system structures and components still meet the intent of the licensing basis. Um, so in, in this case with the containment internal structure even though we know the structure to some respects wasn't built as it was licensed they can still do an operability evaluation that will demonstrate that, that there's still adequate safety margins for all of the design criteria that have to be met for, for the structure, such as dead weight loading, 
you know, different sizes of earthquakes, uh, different types of accidents. They, they basically couple all of these different scenarios together and ensure that the structure can still support uh, all of the equipment that's necessary. So, you know, this isn't uncommon. All licensees have the capability to evaluate degraded non-conforming conditions, but the, but the onus is on them to demonstrate that it's still capable of performing its design function. And obviously it's the NRC's job to review these evaluations and determine if we find them acceptable or not. Well, what were the problems with those structures and what will it take to fix them? Well, the licensee is in the process of evaluating exactly what it's going to take to fix them. Um, you know, I, I'll, I, I'd rather have them answer what they plan to do to fix them, but from my perspective, as I stated today, the NRC is going to be very interested in not only how they fix them, but the timeliness that they uh, fix them. Uh, and, you know, our guidance typically reflects the fact that we want licensees to correct degraded non-conforming conditions at the nearest opportunity <coughs> possible, typically not any later than the next refueling outage. So, you know, based on the complexity of this issue, we understand it's going to take the licensee some time to figure out exactly what the fix is, but we're expecting to see some significant, you know, changes and corrective actions next outage. Well, how can they be allowed to restart if they're basically in violation of the license? Well, they're, they're not. If they're operable, that doesn't mean they're not in violation. You know, we're, we're mixing things here. There is a violation. They're not meeting their license conditions. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the structure is not operable. And that it still will satisfy its design basis function. There's, there's a lot of margin that the NRC requires the licenses to have. And obviously, when there's a degraded or non-conforming condition, some of that margin is lost. But that doesn't mean it's not safe. Thank you. Just, uh, it's not the first time, but it's weird that you would say that it's not safe, but you don't know what it takes to repair it because you're not done yet with the analysis. To me, that's just weird. But um, what I want to say, I want to contend some of the things that have been said tonight, and I hope you give me a chance. What has not been fixed at the plant? I mean, in the sense of what have you not needed to fix? I mean, thousands of things have been fixed. And I'm just curious how much of the plan is left that is considered old, not new stuff that you put together. Just a percentage. Yeah, Michael, let me start. And I'll, let, I'll let the team build up. So, so part of the system readiness that was described tonight and has been inspected is really a systematic review of, uh, of all of the components, uh, major components and support components. And, and, and what that does for us, it not only takes a look at equipment history, um, we also do extensive surveillance testing that proves that the equipment not only can run in its normal configuration, uh, but in support of uh, what it might do to support uh, you know, mitigating an accident. So that whole process is very systematically controlled and is verified by the operators that the plant is in a configuration, uh, both the way it's lined up valve-wise, breaker-wise, uh, but also testing-wise that we meet the, uh, meet the design and licensing configuration of the plant. And you heard Mr. Swanson talk about a majority of the work that we've done across those systems. And as part of our license, if you know, a plant component should break in the future, that will typically put restrictions on us for, uh, for plant operations. So part of the recovery of the plant has been that systematic testing of, of, each, and all, of each and all of the systems uh, in using in integrated teams between our maintenance engineering and operations personnel. And a good example, you know, a few weeks ago, we've been running a lot of the pumps you know, recently, but you know, we ran our concept pump. We put an engineer out there, we put maintenance out there, we put ops out there, we put everyone out in the field, and we ran that pump. Very successful. Seal leaks, very minimal issues. So as we ask that question, if we got an issue with our, some of our equipment, we're going to fix it. You know, when we test it, we run it, and we're extensively testing, you know, as we're preparing for heat up, we are extensively testing all of our equipment as we speak. And if we find issues with it, we're fixing it. The reason I'm concerned by that is 
whenever you put new equipment, because you mentioned that the equipment is going to run far superior than it did before, and the pressures are going to be a lot bigger, everything, because it's new. It's going to have its full pressurized deal. Any old piece of equipment that any of this new stuff is attached to is not going to be able to perform in the same as that new equipment. Just like when you repair cars, you know, you put a new old part or a new part on an old car and it blows out the next part because that old part could not handle the new, new pressures. And this is what concerns me, that, that you have a 40-year-old plant, you replace a whole bunch of stuff with new equipment, you're going to fire it up with new equipment pressures and new equipment heats and new equipment, and then that old equipment might not be able to respond, like expand and contract like the new equipment. If the new equipment might be thinner, because a lot of times we find metals are thinner even though they're stronger. And that, and that thinness, that, 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 that response of the, of the heating and the cooling contraction will be different than the old equipment because that was thicker steel because it was made in 1950 and not in, you know, by, you know, right now. And that's where my concern is, is, is this new equipment attached to old equipment. It's kind of putting like lipstick on a pig kind of thing. And, and I'm really, really concerned that, that that old equipment is not going to be able to you know, hold up. And, and that's my big concern. I'm hoping it's your concern also. And, and the question about the 20,000 hours. Now, you would have a budget. And your budget's 5,000 hours of plant, like you said. What happens to your budget when you have to spend 20,000 hours? I know what happened to ours. They spent $145 million last year to pay for it. So what happens to yours, the NRC's budget? I mean, how do you step up to that when you did not plan for a 20,000 hour power plant? Well, the, the biggest challenge that we've had is obviously finding the resources in the specialty in order to inspect what we've done in the past year. Uh, you know, I've mentioned over the number of public meetings that we've had here, uh, that's been one of the NRC's biggest challenges trying to be uh, responsive to when the licensee is done with certain activities for us to be able to review those activities. And, uh, you know, past meetings, I, I made a comment that it has frustrated us sometimes when the licensee thought they'd be ready and we had resources aligned to look at something uh, just to find out that they weren't ready. Um, you know, that, that hasn't been the case lately. Uh, to the extent that it was in the past, but but from from our perspective, that's that's been the biggest challenge, which is just getting the resources aligned with with the inspections. Now, is there anything that would not be inspected because you don't have the resources? I mean, your budget just could run out, and you just can't show up for that day or that thing or whatever. And I'm just wondering, when does your budget run out, and 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 you know, and does that stop you from your oversight? And do they have to recoup any of these costs back to you, like this OPPD for calling you in when you're not ready? Do they have to, re you know, pay you off or something? I mean, we gotta, you know, help you out, or, or is that just not because you're a federal agency and you're taxed and that's it? They, they get, they get charged for the hours that we, we spent there. The OPPD that, does. Yes, they, yes, they do. But let me give you another perspective. Is that, is that in the future or in the past? Or, or in the past? Maybe in the future because we build them. They, You'll they build a license, and then they, they get to see account all the time that we spend at this site. Let me give you a perspective on the budget. Is one of the things that we talk about is, you know, and Louise mentioned it, is the agency effort. All the regions have budget, excuse me? Yeah, all the regions are, have a budget for the number of inspection hours per the site. But in addition to that, each region is also budgeted to support other regional offices and headquarters for situations just like this, where we have a plan that has performance issues that are thoroughly evaluated and to make sure that the issues are addressed. So that is thought about ahead of time in, in the budget formation to have that, uh, the extra resources available. So it's not just from the Arlington office, the Region 4 office, for example. But we have folks here from the Region 3 office in Lyle, Illinois, that James Cameron is here assisting us. That is part, part of the, the, the planning process that, that we looked at ahead of time. There is kind of need that there is resources available that we put the, uh, the emphasis on the, the safety and the security for these Thank you. Thank you.
Dr. Ryan. And I'm not sure if this microphone is working because I couldn't hear Mike Ryan when he was up. It, it's going in and out. If that's the best you have for the public? Really? I'll try to speak loudly. <coughs> Let's talk a little bit about what happens when the heavy rains fall in Montana like they did in Colorado and the wall of water knocks down the six aging dams above the aging Fort Calhoun plant. And the failure of Fort Calhoun is eminent. What are the specifics of the evacuation plan for the people in the area? I assume there is one. What is it? After those sirens sound, what happens? How do people leave? Where do they go? What about people with no transportation, the infirm and so forth? Who directs the ine inevitable chaos? Is it the Fort Calhoun Police Department? Uh, what sort of public outreach have you done to make sure that people are informed about the evacuation plan? Do you do any at all? Have you ever had a practice run involving members of the public, not just an emergency response team? Have you disseminated this evacuation plan to people beyond the standard 10 mile radius of the plan? If not, why not? I live in Omaha and I've never seen or heard anything about any kind of evacuation as it relates to Fort Calhoun and certainly not to the failure of those six dams. And I'd like to point out that Omaha's northernmost city limit is at the 10 mile uh, point now, not 15 miles which the media likes to uh, report. And I also want to point out that when Fukushima blew up, the United States insisted that all Americans within a 50-5-0 mile radius of the Fukushima plant evacuate. That's how important it was. And we have the 10 mile evacuation radius. I think that's misleading and it's unrealistic. It's an unrealistic circle of so-called safety when we're talking about a nuclear disaster. I'd like to really know what is the evacuation plan? I don't think there is one. And we, I asked this, in fact, I went to the meeting in April of 2011 before the floods. And I asked the same question and it was not answered. It was basically punted off as, you know, we're not Fukushima. We're not gonna have a tsunami. And look what happened. And it's gonna happen again. The unlikely, the unexpected, is happening with more frequency. So what is the plan? Well, just to, just to answer some of what you talked about, with respect to the evacuation plan, you know, the, the county, the city, they're responsible for the evacuation plan. And, and FEMA ensures that, that that is all worked out appropriately. In, in addition to that, every couple of years, the NRC has what we call a graded emergency preparedness exercise, where we uh, basically have the licensee go through a severe accident scenario that would involve them identifying which members of the public need to be evacuated and ensuring that the state and local folks <coughs> understand how to implement those evacuation areas. And, and again, that's, that's an NRC and FEMA type evaluation. The NRC makes sure the licensee understands how to you know, do what's needed at the plant and to do what's needed to inform the state and locals on what needs to be evacuated. And then the state and locals take it from there and ensure that you're informed and, and know when when to leave or when to shelter in, in place. So as far as the details, um, you know, I'm not prepared tonight to tell you all of the details, but, but that's, that's in general how all plants and, and how all localities near plants are structured so that the public does know what to do during any given accident. That's unacceptable. It sounds to me like I could go to Fort Calhoun and knock on the door of a resident nearby the plant and ask them, something happens with this plant, do you know what to do? And I guarantee you they'll say, no. And I'll say, has anyone ever told you? Because I haven't seen anything publicized. I've not seen things on the news media, on TV, nothing. And this should be, the, that's why I asked, what has been the community outreach? Now you pushed it off on the county, but the NRC, you said you had this every two years. 
Well, you do it with the emergency response team, but you don't involve the public, and we're the ones at risk. We're the ones at risk now more than ever. And you talk about restart, reheating, I don't care about that. I don't want that started up until you can guarantee me you've got a plan. And you don't have one that involves the public. Okay, thank you. But part of our public outreach does, does include a direct mailing to each of the citizens in the 10 mile emergency planning zone. Most other public outreach activities, and as, as Mr. Hay mentioned, that includes not only the counties and the local municipalities, but also the state and our graded exercise, which we're looking forward to because we learn uh, good things from that as we work with FEMA and the state. Our, our graded exercise will be in December of this year. I believe that also includes a public meeting in Blair with FEMA to discuss the results of what we learned from that, uh, from that exercise. Mrs. Ryan, I'd also like to add something. You made the connotation that the you know, flooding, yeah, the agency, the NRC doesn't care. Uh, I'd just like to remind you a little bit that it was the NRC that identified the issues with the flooding, the mitigating strategies that were inadequate prior to the floods in 2011. As in, I think it was a contributor to and the action that Fort Camp Moon took that was <coughs> the flooding did occur, there was no, there was not a negative impact on public health and safety as a result. The plant remained in a safe condition. And the other piece of that is, yes, we are concerned from to learn from Fukushima, to learn from the natural, natural disasters that have occurred, as Louise has talked about, that, and, and we're going through working with other agencies as well to ensure that the public safety as well. And and really, the, the key for, for what we're looking at here is that for Calhoun Station, if there was a, a flood, it is that the hand will remain safe, and that the reactor will remain safe, that there, won't, there, there will not be a negative impact on the public from the nuclear reactor. Hi, Mr. Brian, again, I would like to, I think Lou makes a good point here that really the NRC did wonderful work in, in identifying those risks both relative to the flood and, and I really have to agree with it if it were not for NRC really um, uh, being as proactive as you were in insisting on those changes uh, public would have been adversely affected much more during the flood that being said there, there were very good points made uh, uh, even though you mail something out people get they consider that junk mail believe me and, and it's good, it's a, it's a beautiful pamphlet, but nobody reads it. And so if you were to call, just randomly call people in Blair, Missouri Valley, Fort Campbell, and say, what's your escape route? They would have no clue. I'm guaranteeing you that right now. If there was ever, if the sirens went off, we would assume it's a tornado or that it's an ambulance or a fire call and that the volunteer fire department has to come. There's no way for us to know that the siren means it's a nuclear accident, or it's a, it's a fire emergency, or it's a... So there needs to be some way to distinguish a nuclear situation versus another emergency. So I think that's a deficiency in, in the way that the public is notified. But beyond that, um, there are significant deficiencies. I know everybody has the, the best intentions relative to evacuation preparations, but I have to say that a lot of this exercise and, and you know I, I talked to the mayor of our town and said when was the last time that the town actually did a practice evacuation for the schools for the hospital for the old post home it's never been done they have there even though uh, maybe there's a plan in somebody's book at the county seat and maybe there's a few people that understood what that meant. could they make it to the town to implement it and I, I really doubt that that would be the case. But there, there has been some advancements, but there's not enough really to say that we're truly prepared. And I think that's why when you factor in, there's, there's these known deficiencies, but we think it's okay because even though the cement degrades over years, and it's been 40 years, it's been irradiated, and there's been water penetrations, and, and the cement's probably okay, and we think that based on these calculations, we think that the generator that failed at San Onofre, we know it failed, but we have these calculations to say it's probably safe. 
when you multiply all those things together, that's when it starts to fall apart to say, maybe it really is not safe. Maybe we want to make power, but maybe we want safety too. Maybe that is more important at the end of the day. Thank you. My name is Crystal Craig, and um, I'm a member of the Nebraska Sierra Club, as well as some other organizations, but mostly I'm a buzzer, and um, mostly I, I suppose I would like to make a statement rather than ask a question, because as was stated earlier, I, mean, I don't understand a lot of the different language, trying to understand exactly what you guys were talking about. Um, but I would like to just announce that I am also a paying open pay customer and I am not comfortable with risking the safety of my children for this energy. And it seems to me like there were, you guys had plenty of time in the past to make some modifications that were recommended, you know, as far as raising the flood gates and, um, and things like that, and they were not implemented. And had it been, you know, then you maybe would have been in even in an even better position. Um, and it, it seems to me like we are playing a very risky game here. And the people that are living in the vicinity are the ones who are taking the risk for this form of energy. And I'm not, I've been to a couple of these meetings and I just not comforted at all, and I, I'm just like, you know, a person walking in here that doesn't, I'm not an expert or anything, and it just, just doesn't comfort me one little bit, like the number of issues that there are, um, that's like, a, it's a lot, you know, a lot, a lot of problems, and we've spent a lot, a lot, a lot of money on this, and our rates are going up, it's, it's not our cheapest energy form because we are spending so much money on this. Um, I, 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 uh, I would like to know what your estimate is as far as additional spending. Um, how much more spending in man hours is it going to take to fix this plant? Um, you know, should we have maybe just started over from, from scratch at this point? Um, I guess that is a question. Can you tell me how much more um, rate payers are expected to pay into this non-functional plant that's been non-functioning for the past two years and we're still paying a lot, a lot, a lot of money um, when there are other alternative energy resources. Why are we feeding this dead horse? You know, my, I think just kind of interject, it's one of the things Brown that we talked about that we're not talking about the financial issues, but the this being is about forecast and safety. I, mentioned something and said, you know, this is a risky game. No, this is not a game. And we do take the safety. It's very, very serious. In fact, the resident, we have inspectors that work for the NRC that do live in the vicinity of Fort Calhoun Station. They, they're also there. And they, so they assure your concern. They want the plan to be as safe as, as possible. But as possible, I mean, though, you say as safe as possible. Have like a 100% safety guarantee here. I mean, like that's really what is important is safety. So it doesn't matter if it's, you know we have electricity or not if we're all suffering from our choice of energy here. Like if this plant was so far outdated and so far gone, I mean, where where do we draw the line and say this is just not worth the time here? Like it's, there are too many safety issues issues continually are popping up. You know, what happens if they get the go-ahead and then all this, there are more issues that have been undiscovered? I mean, how much is too much? What I can tell you is that we will do whatever we can, the whole agency effort, to ensure that the plan is safe. <coughs> and we'll, that safety systems will work, that the, talked about this, the processes that are in place and that the people are ready to operate the plant. We haven't made a decision yet on that, but that's what we'll be doing to ensure safety. Thank you. Another note card. I'm going to paraphrase this one. 
<coughs> are the standard, the regulatory standards imposed by the NRC available to all nuclear plants so that we have no surprises? And I think this is going towards, uh, progressing towards restart. Can you repeat that again on the regulatory standards? Avail that are imposed by the NRC available to all nuclear plants so that there are no surprises. Well, I, yes, uh, all of the requirements on how to operate the plant are contained in the Code of Federal Regulations. In addition to that, every plant has what's called a license, which dictates what uh, license conditions are imposed in addition to the, what's in the Code of Federal Regulations. So there shouldn't be any unknown uh, standards or requirements that, that licensees shouldn't be aware of. Thank you. With respect to the flooding protection, uh, you've closed out that issue, as I understand it, and I'd like to know where the public can get documentation or information on exactly what modifications OPPD made to Fort Calhoun uh, to uh, justify your closing out that issue, especially with respect to the uh, the question of the upstream dam failures. Uh, all I've seen was, I think back in May, OPPD had a, uh, a little drawing of you know, the floodgate and that kind of thing. But I, I'd like to some real documentation of exactly what modifications they made and why your panel was satisfied that OPPD is safe, or that Fort Calhoun is safe from flooding, including the upstream dam failures. Is that available to the public? Absolutely. Matter of fact, uh, there's a lot of reports that have been issued since last <coughs> December that pertain to flooding. Uh, matter of fact, there was one standalone report that specifically addressed the modifications that the licensee made to the intake structure. Uh, where we uh, basically determined that they didn't adequately implement the modification process and, and didn't implement what's called the 50-59 process, right, which is a process by which they determine if there's a review and approval needed when they make those mods. Uh, so that's one report that is specifically devoted to flooding. In addition to that, there are also other reports that specifically talked to the different areas of flooding that we looked at. The sluice gates, we had multiple issues where we talked about uh, sluice gates leaking, sluice gates not being tested right. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned previously we looked at other uh, flooding aspects also. And so I, I, I would tell you it's, it's, it's there if you go and look what's on the docket. Now with respect to the With respect to the dam failure, uh, that has not been on the docket yet. We are still in the process of working with the Corps of Engineers. We are still internally, we have a group of people that are specifically devoted to looking at the, the different uh, uh, flood studies that are currently uh, available. And, and there are more studies that are going to be done. So, as of right now, there is no specific report that deals with dam failures. However, as I mentioned, we are going to be inspecting a strategy that the licensee developed, which will take into account higher flood elevations than, than their licensee basis. And, and that, that inspection will be done during EDO, and that will be documented. I, I, um, think, I think Wally, um, Part of what your your question is getting to is if you look at the restart checklist basis document and you look at the structure of most of the reports that I've done and you take the individual items in there and say this is closed because this is what we did and I think that's kind of what you're getting at well, with, se with section one on the flooding so we were a little proactive uh, today to tell you uh, that the panel uh, had close that item. So we're a little bit ahead of the report. So where all of that information 
all together in one place you'll be able to get to will be the sooner of my next inspection report, which period ends September 30th, or the most recent uh, big team report. It will be documented in one of those two. That's where you'll be able to get all of the information that Mike talked about accumulated together and why we decided, why the panel decided to close that issue. I think that's what you Yeah, the problem is I'm not an engineer, I'm just a lawyer, so I'm... Right, no, no, I, <laughs> I understand, but I, I, I hope that helps. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Mike Carberry, again with the Sierra Club. Uh, you had uh, said uh, actions in progress, you listed geotechnical. Well, one of the issues that's geotechnical that I'm very concerned about is subsoil structures and underground cables. As we all know, we had a major flood there in uh, 2011, and the uh, water weighs eight pounds a gallon. And so there were how many millions of gallons of water that weigh eight, eight pounds per gallon that were sitting on top for a long time, some underground cable, and subsoil structures at Fort Calhoun. Uh, a colleague of mine named Paul Gunter from Beyond Nuclear uh, was very interested in this and submitted a FOIA, a Freedom of Information Act to the NRC, over a year and a half ago to find out a little bit about that. He's been basically stonewalled for a year and a half. So my question to the NRC here is how much of the uh, unqualified cable, I mean, there's a lot of things that got wet that shouldn't have been wet. There's a lot of things that probably got crushed that should have been crushed. How much of this underground cable and subsoil structures have been looked at? And what can you tell us about that? That's probably, other than flooding, is my biggest concern about uh, a restart of the Fort Kelly. If you look at the reports that dealt with the flood recovery, which I spoke of earlier today, you will see uh, in their um, flood recovery actions that have to do with underground cable that runs from the switchyard to the plant that was replaced. And <clears throat> I, I can get with you and at some point get you specific inspection report numbers at a later date if you want to. <clears throat> Beyond that, all of the safety-related cables that are underground are between the auxiliary building and the intake structure. And we've heard a lot of discussion over time, and I know OPPD mentioned it earlier today, uh, manhole 5 and manhole 31. Uh, and that's the cables traverse from the auxiliary building into the intake structure through those two manholes. Uh, Mantle 31, it had substantial damage and a lot of work was done to the manhole itself. All of the cables that traversed through there were in conduit. So they did get the conduit repaired and again, I get you the inspection report numbers on, on the actual cable testing that they did find out that the cable itself have some protection uh, from the water, from the conduit, but all of the cable, the safety related cable between those two buildings, uh, tested satisfactorily. I look forward to getting those from you, John. Thank you. Thank you. You, you, you bet. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name's Alan Bobolka. I'm one of the tens of millions of people who drink water from the Missouri River downstream from the Fort Cal plant. <coughs> Uh, and I'm concerned, I understand that it's going to be very, should we say, awkward, uh, difficult to move the plant away from the river. But there is spent fuel stored on site on what I'm going to refer to as the flood plant. I don't know if that's the legal flood plant, but it is the plant where the floodwaters go when it floods. Uh, there was a number like 50 feet tossed out earlier. You wouldn't have to move that very far, what, a mile or less, to get it 50 feet higher than it is now. Um, 
does the NRC, I know there are reevaluations of ways to broadcast storage, and there's a March 12, 2015 day to have flooding and hazards reevaluated. But do we really need to wait to get that spent fuel out of the flood? One thing that we did, that's a, that's a very good question. But uh, one thing that we focused on and we looked at is the impact of flooding on the independent spent fuel storage installation where the fuel is being stored. And actually, the way it's kind of configured is that currently, right now, there's air that goes through and pulls it. And the evaluation was done to see if, okay, if it was all covered with water, what would happen? Because it's all within a stainless steel cast. It's not like the fuel is just out there, right? So it would still remain cool and it would still be protected within that cast. Regarding the moving it, you know, 50 feet higher or whatever, I don't know of any study or anything that's done on that. But I know that the, that the cast have been evaluated for being in a flooded condition. Thank you. Uh, one small point about uh, the evacuation uh, uh, problem. Uh, the actual distance from uh, Omaha to Fort Calhoun is 10 miles. If you go to Google Earth and, and uh, use their distance measuring tool, you'll see that Fort Calhoun is only 10 miles from the northern uh, city limits up by uh, standing there late. It's just bugged me for a long time, but every article I read or every TV, TV report about it, uh, Fort Calhoun talks about it being 20 miles away. It's not. Um, <laughs> another thing about uh, evacuation, and uh, my wife said that uh, uh, there appears to not be any kind of a plan, uh, especially for Omaha, or if there is one, we don't know about it. So what do we do? Now, I've seen uh, in fairly recent uh, uh, television pieces, uh, members of the OPPD staff and, and the excellent folks wearing these black uh, golf shirts with a nice little OPPD logo on it. I would suggest that you put on the back of the shirt something like, if you see me running, follow me. That's at least better than what we've got now. Now I'd like to talk a little bit more about the dam situation. And uh, I'm going to refer to three reports that were done by NRC staff. Uh, the first one was done by Dr. Ferrante. Uh, do you know if he's still, any of you folks uh, from the NRC, do you know if he's still a staff person at the NRC? This was done? I do not know. Okay. Big organization. This was done uh, uh, in 2010. And, uh, he uh, did an analysis of uh, what would happen if there was one dam failure. Now, uh, back in 2011, I believe the highest level that the water got in Fort Calhoun was somewhere around 1,007 feet above sea level. Okay. What Dr. Ferrante is saying is uh, if there's a dam break, all normal plant equipment will fail at 10,000, 10 feet above sea level, three feet more than what we had in 2011. Safety-related equipment fails at 10,000, 14 feet, seven feet above the level we had in 2011. He predicts that that one dam failure uh, would give us a water level at Fort Calhoun of 1,029. 22 feet above the level that was experienced in 2011. Uh, the flood wave would hit in 2.6 days from one large dam failure. Peak flood at the 10,029 feet would hit in 3.9 days. Now we have some advanced notice, but we can't pick the plant up and move it. We can't pick up all the spent fuel 
and moved it. The second report, and this uh, this report uh, doesn't necessarily uh, uh, give a figure in feet as to what would happen with a dam failure, but it's the, the Perkins report, and there was a lot of uh, hullabaloo about uh, getting this information out. Uh, I think Mike, uh, you had some experience with uh, uh, with that particular report, but it was fine. it finally came out, and uh, uh, you know copies are available. But this report was done by an engineer uh, at the NRC, an, an NRC employee, another engineer, and two PhDs. Uh, the engineer's name was Perkins, and he got whistleblower protection. Uh, in that uh, analysis. Uh, Various uh, uh, reactors were rated uh, as far as uh, probable effects from flooding, from dam failure, and Fort Calhoun was right up there at the top of the list with Okani and some others. Uh, in that previous report, uh, again, Fort Calhoun was at the top of the list. It was rated high uh, probability. Uh, Cooper Station down south of us was rated at medium probability. The last report, the most recent report, is the Loveless report. Now, we haven't been able to get our hands on that report, but we got, got kind of a brief synopsis in a memo that was sent to Elmo Collins, uh, the formal, former uh, head guy of Region 4. And in that memo, it described uh, some things that were in this Loveless analysis. And supposedly, again, Employee Loveless. Uh, he used more recent core data and found that the break of the Oahe Dam, the Philly Oahe Dam, would result in a flood level at Fort Calzone of 1,060 feet above sea level. That's 53 feet above the level in 2011. Now realize these dams in South Dakota are made out of dirt. Their spillways are concrete, but if they're overtopped, they'll fail. As I mentioned at the last meeting, uh, Fort Peck Reservoir, uh, built in 1938 in Montana, that's the top dam, that's the first one, failed in 1938. When there was a high wind event and waves were pushed over the top of the dam, the dam failed. It's just dirt, folks. That one isn't even compacted there. It's 75 years old, and it's just sitting there, waiting for a heavy snow melt, maybe a big spring rain like they got in Colorado. Both of those events together are going to push it over. And so I'm sitting here with this gun pointed at my head, and my utility doesn't even need Fort Cal. They can meet the demand of the ratepayers without Fort Calhoun. Now I realize that you have to buy some power now because Fort Calhoun is shut down. But that's because you're selling power. Selling power outside of your rate data base. You're not a merchant utility, you're a public utility. And I'm tired of being victimized by my government. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Tom Foster, former NRD director for the Papio Missouri River Valley Natural Resources District. And I just want to tell you that those dams are more 50% full of silt, so they are providing a false sense of security for our community and all the communities downstream. If you think they're going to hold back any uh, appreciable amount of flood water, you're wrong. So if you're not aware of these, Facts you need to uh, bone up on because when they say that Fort Calhoun is at the top of the list uh, for uh, flood uh, potential, they're not kidding. And they might not even know that those dam reservoirs are full of dirt. They're not really holding back much water. <laughs> Hardly any water to fill them up. Thank you. I think we're right at one out of time now. Um, thank you. If you have any additional questions, remember the NRC staff will be around immediately following the 